anybody would like a copy, uh, please contact one of the school committee members or uh, a member of the administration. <coughs> our, our first item of business today is the approval of minutes, and, and what you'll find is the um, executive uh, minutes from the executive session held on April 27th. Uh, the minutes from our previous school committee meeting on May 4th that uh, will be provided at, at the next meeting. Um, so do I have a motion to approve the minutes of the executive session held on uh, April 27th? Motion from Jim, seconded by Scott. All in favor? And our next agenda item is announcements, correspondence, and distributions. Does anyone have any announcements or correspondence? Mr. Mr. Chair, I've, I've got a, I've got a um, little correspondence or announcement. Um, dealing with some emails that I've gotten from some teachers regarding some um, cuts due to the special ed teachers over at Woodland. Um, I'm, I'm curious to find out why these cuts are being made and who's making these cuts. Um, we, we just approved a $46 million budget with hopes that we wouldn't make any cuts to any teachers in any school. Um, and from what I'm told from these teachers and some emails that these cuts are made due to budget restraints. I don't know if we can get maybe Tim in here or talk to Lucy and, and I thought we weren't cutting any special ed teachers, period. Um, and I just want to clarify what's going on. To be honest with you, you I can I can actually that? very quickly address yep. that. Um, I believe Mr. Kiernan will be meeting, or he may have already met with the uh, special education staff. And I think there was a miscommunication that went on. Okay. There are absolutely no positions being um, cut due to due to budgetary reasons. Um, the only the only positions that we are reducing um, were happening through attrition, and, and the, the most of those I believe it was fifteen are happening at the teaching assistant or behavioral assistant level. Okay. So this has nothing to do with budgets or anything, because that's Correct. what a lot of teachers Correct. were. And I, and I believe if Mr. Kane already about. hasn't met with the faculty or the the, the staff that um, I think the the, con the original conversation occurred with, I think it's going to happen early next week. Okay. 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 As long as that's straightened and absolutely, I'm good. Absolutely. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Any other announcements or correspondence? Scott, I mean, um, yeah, actually, just as we're getting into this time of year and. and we're getting ready to kind of move into our next year, believe it or not. It doesn't feel like it's going to be a, a whole other year, but it is for us starting July 1st. Just a, a quick question. We have so much stuff that's going on right now. Can we make sure that our school committee calendar is shared amongst the schools? There's been a longstanding tradition that um, we work with the principals. We share our calendar. We don't have that many meetings, although not some always feel that way. Uh, we don't have that many meetings, they're the, they're, and they're very consistent. They're laid out well in advance. Um, we've had multiple occurrences over the last several months and over the last year or so where it's been, um, there's been an event that the school committee should be at, in my opinion, such as National Honor Society induction ceremony that was at the same time as we had a scheduled meeting. Now, it wasn't for our regular schedule, I realized that, but that's one example. So if we can share our meeting schedule and to the best of all possible <laughs> abilities, ask the principals to make sure that they're keeping that in mind when they're scheduling out their events. And if we need to be flexible as a committee as well to make sure that we're able to be there to support our students um, and, and in some cases not have, you know, most of the, have the, the people that are members of this board as well have to choose between being a school committee member and being a parent. I think that's something we're definitely going to strive for as much as possible, Scott. The We've only, done it for years. The, the only, the only this exception, just been the last yeah, no, year. There's been a lot of conflict. A little I agree. There's been a lot, a lot of conflict, conflict this year. This year. Yeah. The one exception would be the athletic schedule because we've lost so much to weather. That, I get. I certainly yeah. understand. But it's things like, uh, like I said, National Honor Society is the most recent one that comes to mind. There's been parent-teacher nights that yep. have been the same night as school committee meetings. There's been parent-teacher conferences. No one who is either currently on the board or has ambitions to be on the board should ever have to choose, in my opinion, between being a parent and being a, being a school committee member to support them as a student. And we'll definitely make that a calendar priority for 17-18. Great, thank you. Yep, no problem. We, we, to your point, we did have a conflict that first meeting in June, and we, yeah. we scheduled our meeting so that yeah. we can attend the senior event. So yeah, yep. definitely something worth Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, any other announcements for Jim? Yep, I just want to um, <clears throat> let everybody know that we are, uh, or we would request that you join us for a special screening of um, screenagers growing up in the digital age. This is by Milford Public Schools on June 12th uh, at 6.30 p.m. at Woodland, Woodland Elementary School, and it is free admission. So we encourage everybody to come out and, uh, and check out that production. Thank you. Real quick, do I believe that's ages 10 and up? In case anyone Cor wants correct. To that's a great point, Joe. 
My apologies, it's not on my. It's okay. <laughs> it's, uh, that's why I'm here. <laughs> when that's didn't make the marketing material. <laughs> What's that? Didn't make the marketing material. It did not make the marketing material, so I'll uh, I'll definitely have to speak to my handler. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I also just want, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just I also want to give a shout out. There were a number of high school students who actually went down and uh, were present at Stacy Middle School earlier this week, just really talking about and, and certainly kudos to the uh, to our marketing um, group subcommittee that you know the the high school kids went down. They were talking to the eighth graders, really again continuing to promote all the wonderful things that we have going on at Melford High and and certainly continuing to influence them. Um, as I've said in the past, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the parent of, in full disclosure, I'm the parent of a middle school student. He's in seventh grade and he was hearing about it from his friends who were in the eighth grade and hearing, wow, did you, did you know they had this at Milford High School? Yeah, I may have heard about it a little bit, <laughs> but um, so I think it's phenomenal. I'm really, you know, very excited and, and very, very proud to, to see those students continue to go down and, and that effort really taking hold and the students really talking about it, which is yeah. what we want here, so. Absolutely. Kevin, you had some I, I, Yeah, I had two quick announcements, Mr. Chairman. Um, the first is I just want to share the, um, an update on the uh, Milford High School principal search. We began the process with 53 candidates. The screening committee identified 12 semifinalists for interviews. We had two interview committees in, who identified three finalists. On Tuesday, May 23rd, we were holding a forum for parents, students, and families in the Milford High School Library Media Center starting at 6 p.m. and ending at approximately 7.30 p.m. Each candidate session will run for about 30 minutes, and the finalists will share their background and qualifications for the position and answer any questions that the parents, students, or community members may have. Parents, students, and community members will also be afforded an opportunity to provide feedback for each candidate at the conclusion of the three forums. Please bring questions to ask the candidates, and we really encourage you to participate in this very important event. Additionally, all the finalists will have a site visit at Milford High School during the day where they'll visit classes, speak with teachers and students. They'll have interviews with the assistant superintendent and myself and participate in an administrator and school committee forum and a faculty forum. The schedule um, is 6 p.m. Larissa Doherty will meet with parents and students, 6.30 p.m. Robert McCarty, and 7 p.m. Joshua Otlin. And uh, we have, I think, fantastic finalists. Um, we're, we're, I think we're in a very good position in the search process. I want to commend the students that participated in that as well. Um, I they had an opportunity awesome. to sit in on that, and it was, I, I mean, it was 10 hours of interviews over the course of two days. Um, I, and the students' questions were um, not only appropriate, but professional. They were very global in scope, meaning that it wasn't pertaining to just perhaps the one or two things that they may be involved in. Or and a few of the questions some were of them. Spanish. And it, right, to the point where the part I, w I will tell you is, um, one of our candidates, a couple of our candidates actually spoke fluent Spanish. One of the students in the room, when it was time for her to read a question, said, asked the question, said, can I ask this in Spanish? We of course said yes. She asked the question in Spanish, the candidate replied in Spanish, and they actually went through a dialogue around further details and the student actually drilled in. Just to be clear, this is not, an, this is not a senior who has ambitions of being a Spanish teacher who's taking an AP class. This is a sophomore who sat there and went into that level of details. That's just one example. It, it was literally, it was 10 hours of sitting in a room with, with very limited air and limited windows, and these students were phenomenal. I, they, should, they should be very proud of themselves as well as their parents should be very proud of them, and we should be very proud of them. It was, it was I will tell you, every one of us that were, had an opportunity <laughs> to sit with them for, during that interview process walked out of that room just saying, wow, what just simply amazing kids, so. Good. And I have one more quick one, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, the, other, the other thing is something really exciting, um, a new partnership in Milford High School. Um, we're starting an internship program with the Waters Corporation right here in Milford. And Waters Corp is a worldwide leader in, and I'm going to read this, complementary analytical technologies including liquid, chromatography, mass spectrometry, rhetometry, and microcalorimetry. And I'm going to have Joe Callery explain that to everybody <laughs> after the meeting. <laughs> Um, it's, uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually a fantastic partnership. Um, this year we're beginning with one student over the summer, and this is in connection with the Blackstone Valley Education Foundation, who I want to thank for helping to support um, this partnership, um, as well as the Baker and Polito administration, because they're very involved in connecting schools and students to manufacturing. 
And I also want to recognize um, Joe uh, Marias and Jim Lagore for engaging in a lot of the conversations we had throughout the process. Um, I think it's, it's very exciting. Um, the student um, who will be participating in the internship this summer is Oscar Pineda, um, who has a great background in the sciences and mathematics and is interested in pursuing a career in, in, in probably the STEM field. Uh, these types of programs are programs that we want to continue to build and explore. I think this is an exciting opportunity. I know Waters um, is also very excited. We want to thank them for, for taking a chance on Milford High School and a Milford High School student. That's great. Um, so I, I just had a, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I wanted to congr congratulate the newest inductees into the Art and Honor Society. Uh, we were able to attend the ceremony prior to the meeting, and it was a great ceremony. We're very proud of, of all those students who, who were inducted tonight. Um, and then lastly, um, we have Celebrate Milford coming up on, on Saturday. We're all very excited, uh, but I, I wanted to thank um, all the students. The staff, the PTOs are going to be actively participating in the event and helping us promote the event. Uh, you know, we're very thankful for their, their support, and uh, it's going to be a great day. So. All right, any other announcements or correspondence? No? All right, so our next agenda item is invitation to speak, and we have Kara Alves here to give us an update on the high school. Seniors in the top 10% of the class were honored by the Milford Area Chamber of Commerce at the annual Chamber Scholars Dinner at Lake Pro. Harry Revol spoke on behalf of the class and shared the notable accomplishments of the graduating class as well as the colleges that students in attendance will be attending. Allison Buckmeyer was awarded the Waters Corporation Scholarship for Excellence in Science. Nia Johnson was awarded the Milford Area Chamber Citizenship Scholarship Award. And Montana Achu was awarded the Cornerstone at Milford Scholarship Award. Milford students earned three out of the five scholarship program awards besting the 11 schools in attendance. Congratulations to our Chamber Scholars. On May 5th, the National Art Society hosted the annual Senior Citizens Prom. Senior Citizens students enjoyed dinner, dancing, prizes, and the crowning of Prom King and Queen. This special event brings together generations in our community for an evening of wonderful conversations and memorable moments. Harry Raval was honored today by receiving the Dean Bank WMRC Student Achiever Award. Hari participated in a live broadcast at MHS with staff from WMRC, Dean Bank, Mrs. Hunter, Ms. Montero, and Mrs. Banach. Hari's amazing accomplishments and his acceptance to Princeton were the highlight of the interview. Congratulations, Hari. The freshman class car wash fundraiser is this Saturday, May 20th from 9 to 1 at the high school. Please come for a car wash and support the freshman class. Good luck to the seniors as they head into their final exams next week. Many senior festivities are coming up, including the Dick Corbin Senior Night, which is an athletic award night on May 22nd at 7 p.m. and the senior prom on May 26th. We will be having our second annual prom promenade in the gym starting at 5.15 prior to the senior prom at Dimitri's. The senior prom is followed by the after prom party at Pins from 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. The senior carnival is May 30th, senior awards night is May 31st, and the senior night is June 1st. Special thanks to the boosters, the after prom committee, the senior class advisors, the senior class leaders, and all the faculty, parents, and students who devoted their so much time to making these events spectacularly memorable for the class of 2017. Thank you. Nice job, Kyra. Thank, Thank you. Nice job. Any questions for <coughs> Kyra? Nope. No? Great job. Thank you. Great job. Just Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> you <fun>. did wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and it, it, Kyrie mentioned that the Chamber of Commerce. I, I just want to thank the, the Chamber for their continued support of our, our students. Uh, they've, they've been supporting our students for several years, for many, many years, and it's very much appreciated. So. Um, all right, our next agenda item is the School Improvement Plan and Family Handbook for Stacy Middle School. Would you like to come on up? <laughs> I just got here. <laughs> we don't want to start no. like that already. <laughs> this is where I always sit. <laughs> just joking. But no, really, I do like it on this side. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for having us this evening. Um, I wanted to introduce Ryan McHale. Ryan is um, the English Language Arts and Reading Curriculum Team Leader. Also this year, Ryan has um, taken on the administrative internship role as he's exploring a 
leadership as a future career at some point. So he's here as twofold, um, as an administrative intern, but also he is the co-chair of school council. Okay. This evening I will be presenting the school improvement plan, and Ryan will be presenting the handbook. Which one would like uh, would you like to hear first? Um, you know, why don't we start with the, the handbook? Okay. That's okay. All right. So uh, we'll just go over some of the, the bigger changes uh, that we kind of installed into the, the handbook for next year. Uh, obviously, you'll have your minor changes the year and the website and all that. But uh, a couple of things to go over. Uh, core values, the addition of uh, new core values for uh, to coincide with the NEASC uh, reaccreditation process that is ongoing. Uh, so we will be inserting our new core values right into the front of the handbook. Uh, the academic social enrichment, uh, we change the verbiage of uh, the description uh, to kind of incorporate the social emotional learning piece that uh, will become a big part of the curriculum uh, through all cores at Stacy Middle School and throughout the district. Uh, in terms of responsibility of students, parents, and guardians, and teachers, uh, we did make an addition of respecting and, and not damaging or vandalizing school property. Uh, one issue with the Chromebooks and uh, want to make sure that the kids are held accountable uh, in treating those with respect. Uh, the anti-bullying pledge, uh, we made a, a significant change there in just adding uh, sexual orientation and transgender identity uh, to that pledge to ensure that all of our students uh, feel safe and welcome uh, in the building. Uh, the retention prevention plan, it, I think, is going to be uh, the biggest change uh, that you'll find in the handbook at Stacy. Uh, we have primarily in the past set a number in terms of what a student can earn on their report card. Uh, in case they were to have a, a bad trimester, that it wouldn't mathematically uh, make it impossible um, for them to pass for the year. Uh, so what we have done, uh, we have changed that to any student receiving less than a 60 uh, will receive an FW, a failure warning on their report card. Uh, and at that time, what that'll do is that'll initiate conversation uh, between the teacher, the student, parent and guardians, uh, guidance counselor, administration, uh, to complete uh, a self-directed, self-improvement plan for the student uh, in order to not only help them uh, make it possible to pass for the year, but also hold them accountable to uh, not only comply with what's being asked, but to show that growth uh, throughout the year. Uh, make sure that they are making the academic and social gains that we would uh, expect to see uh, and if they were to do that, uh, we would then replace that FW from the report card and make that a 60. Uh, and so that should allow that student to, to pass for the year. Um, that is a, a pretty significant change uh, and one that I think will meet the needs of faculty, staff, and the kids uh, moving forward. Uh, homework policy has been deleted from the actual handbook. Uh, and instead we went with uh, guidelines, which is not going to be a policy, uh, but uh, just a, a list of things that uh, teachers may be able to do um, in terms of homework. So uh, just, but just to clarify that, so we just changed language. We, we used the word policy in the heading, and we just changed the word to guideline guidelines. instead of policy. Okay. Because only you guys can do that. I was just <laughs> yeah. say, and, and, and just yeah. to be clear, Craig, you had mentioned that there's a committee and a district-wide yep. look into that? Okay, thank you. Yeah. I know so it's just an adjustment on the title the language. Title, yeah. So policy to guideline, yeah. just a change in word. Yeah. Uh, competitive sports, you know, with the addition of eighth grade in the building, we are looking forward to kind of expanding the sports that we have. Uh, and we will be adding volleyball, both girls and boys, and mm -hmm. that is in the handbook for next year. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, couple of other things items prohibited during school hours one of the big things right now are the fidgets and the uh, spinners that mm -hmm. we, we have going around uh, what we have added is that uh, fidgets will be prohibited during school hours unless uh, written into an educational plan and in that case you know that student would be allowed to have that in the classroom uh, and uh, the last two things that you know we just wanted to address briefly uh, hallway passes 
uh, within the building, all students will be given uh, passports, and that's something that the eighth grade students have had all year that has been very successful in making sure we know uh, where the students are going and they're signing in and signing back in uh, when they get back to the classroom. And office detentions. Um, office detention will now take place after school for a full 50 minute period with an administrative uh, <coughs> member, uh, assistant principal. Uh, and we have also deleted the five unexcused tardies making an office detention and uh, changed that to eight unexcused tardies out there. Uh, so those are the, the highlights of the changes to the handbook. And if there are any questions, then I go to the school improvement. Does anyone have any questions regarding the handbook? Yeah. Um, so actually, what question probably more for Craig. Um, so so the, the committee that's being put together for the, mm -hmm. the homework, to develop the homework guidelines, I assume w w once that committee meets and, and, and lays out uh, a roadmap that that would then be incorporated into the yeah, handbooks. And we'll update we'll update you guys regularly on that. But yes, that's the plan. And and it may it may be actually an insert into it may be more than one little paragraph too. Yeah. So it may be just something separate. Okay. But they'll be able to reference it to that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we'll give them language. All right. Um, and, and then you, me you mentioned the o the office detention. So um, it, this is a question for e either one of you. It, so. It, the teachers are still able to issue detentions in the mm -hmm. classroom, right? Yeah. Um, yes. So if there's yes. an issue there, <laughs> the, the teacher can have the child stay after school with them. Yeah. We would prefer that. Um, what yeah. happens is it's the only time you go to an office detention is when the intervention in the classroom, which you would want to call tier one leveling, which is done in the classroom by the teacher, isn't really being effective or the student isn't com in compliance with that, then it bumps up to an office detention. The reason the language is changed in there to a 50 minute period is we worked in unison with the union in terms of being able to identify how long the office detention period was. Um, they felt it was important to have a concrete time in there to make it more of a deterrent for our students. So we um, met as a group and really collaboratively talked about that and we, we felt that that was a really good idea so that's why we wanted to um, change that language. Okay, so yeah, the, always we want the teachers to be able to handle um, most of the issues within their own classrooms with, uh, according to their own expectation. Um, it's only when that's not going well or students really aren't being compliant with that or they choose to do things that maybe just are a little bit worse than being with the teacher is when they would go to office detention. Okay. And we're seeing consistency there where teachers are trying to address it in their classrooms as opposed to using the office as a crutch. I think so. It, it, it's a difficult situation when you start talking about behaviors, you know. Um, some people are really good at them and some people have a little bit more time managing it. But I say that teachers are really doing a very good job working expectations and really trying to self-correct and offer intervention within the tier one setting, which is in their own classroom. I think our teachers are great, but I always think that. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, so as it relates to that, when, um, I'm going back some, so when I, I remember the last awareness that I have as far as detentions are concerned is, we'll call it 25 years ago, it may have been longer, uh, when I was in school. When you were so up here? Or? No, not here. No, I never had any here. I can't <laughs> say that was always the case. But not when at the high school. <laughs> okay. um, the, um, so a, an in-class detention, so we'll, we'll say that you know, a teacher issues a detention to a student. Um, <coughs> unfortunately, in this day and age, it's, there may be some teachers that don't feel comfortable um, issuing a detention if it may be just one student and one teacher in a room at a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is, there, is it a centralized place for those outside the office detentions? Mm -hmm. Are teachers able to collaborate? So if John and I are both teachers, we both have one student, can we kind of be together and bring our students in one place as well? Is there mm -hmm. an avenue to be able to do that or is it still, is the expectation that it's still in one place? Well, that's a really good question. I'm glad you brought it up. If you look at the structure of Stacy Middle School, it's very team oriented mm -hmm. and we give the teams a lot of autonomy to kind of deal with and, and address students. They have their own kind of set of expectations for clusters. If someone's being difficult or needing a timeout in one room, oftentimes they'll go into the back of another room until they can collect themselves. That as such, there's no rule in place saying that a teacher must stay in their own room during a detention. If they feel like they need to go in where somebody else is and conduct that together, that, that's fine. 
There, okay. There's no rule against that at all. And quite frankly, I think I'm reading why you would say that, and it's mm -hmm. not a bad idea. Perfect. And that's why I just... In certain cases. Too, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, it just no given the opportunity... That. Yeah, just there's given no the opportunity to be able to have those teachers, A, be aware that that's an option. Because sometimes mm -hmm. it's, you know... Yeah, sure. As we all do as adults, sometimes we take things literally. Um, I do it myself. But... Um, you know, making sure that that's a, a visible piece for the teachers as well, to know that they can collaborate with that. Um, I can see that hopefully that's never the case, but I can see it may be a deterrent from a teacher saying, you know what, I, this, kid, this student really does need to be held accountable for their actions, but I either can't stay this afternoon or I'm not in a pos position where we can have more than one, I've only got one student, and it may be just a, a personal belief as well. So, so that's a little bit different in my opinion. So. So if, some, if I'm the teacher and you're being a freshie pants and I give you a detention, right? Mm -hmm. So I feel like as a teacher, it's my responsibility to be there. Let's just say that I'm sick or something, I have to leave. Right. What happens to that child? Right. So I either ask uh, Mr. Consigli, who's my compadre down the hall, can you cover this detention for me? And he says yay or nay, right? And if that doesn't happen, then that child has to be notified that I had to leave early or something like that. So you're asking for um, a plan B in the event someone is either one, having to leave ill, or two, not really feeling comfortable being alone in a room with one hmm. child. That's fine. Okay. I don't yeah, see I'm just making it aware. It was, just a, it was yeah. a question that I had as, sure. as you were talking about it. So. No, it's, a good, it's, it's actually a really good point. And you're like, well, yeah, why wouldn't you do that? But if I didn't say you could, you might not. So that's what you're getting at, right? All right. Correct. That's yep. a good point, and I definitely will make sure the teachers are aware of it. Great. Thanks, Nancy. You're welcome. Any other questions regarding the handbook? No. Do I have a motion to approve the Stacy Middle School handbook? Motion from Joey, seconded by Jim. All in favor? Thank Great. you. I, thank I you would also show. like to take the opportunity to thank the school council as well as the faculty, staff, and parents who made comment on the handbook. This year we actually had a real lot of comment, uh, which was really exciting because sometimes you send it out and you're like, oh man, I don't like anyone read it. <laughs> Then you keep looking at it. You know when you look at a document a million times and eventually you don't see those little nuances that somebody else with fresh eyes sees. So we did have a lot of people we give did. comment on the handbook, so we really appreciate yeah. that, as well as the, um, the school improvement plan. And I, I would just like to add, too, in terms of the anti-bullying pledge with the addition of sexual orientation, transgender identity, while it's always been mm -hmm. you know, thought of as you know, that's an inclusive in our pledge, uh, it was actually an eighth grade student who read the handbook and mm -hmm. asked about that addition okay. and I just thought that that was a fantastic observation by that student okay. uh, and yeah. allowed us to put that in there. That's great. Okay. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. really good. Yeah. So the, the, um, the school improvement plan is, is kind of one of those documents that you're always trying to work on to improve. This year it's a little bit different. With the accreditation process, last time when I was here last year I was talking with you about a seven year report if you recall. Um, NEASC accreditation had changed the formatting for how they're going to be approaching upcoming accreditation. So the seven-year report process kind of went to the wayside and they started a whole different process. So we're kind of coming in almost at the pilot phase, but not really the pilot phase. There's a couple middle schools who are doing it, but we're kind of at the, the beginning of it all. So we are responsible for doing something called the self-assessment. And within that self-assessment, we have to identify areas of need. Now, we started that in the fall. The, um, the gal from NIAS came in January to talk to the teachers, and then we started moving. So you guys know that you're like, oh my god, we have to go to school committee in May to, to do this. So we tried to do our best <laughs> to identify where we think our areas of need based on data. For example, the Metro West Health Survey about social emotional learning. So you see that's a big focus in, in this, um, this process. Within this, we also had to make adjustments to try to hit the uh, standards as identified, not only by our evaluation rubric, but also by NEAS. So you'll see a little bit of formatting differences in here. It's because we're trying to meet the accreditation standards as set by NEASC. Okay, so I wanted to kind of set the stage for that. Um, so we're still following the format for Milford Public Schools. Um, if you go to... The third page, um, this is our the mission statement. The community voted to keep the mission statement as is, but underneath is what Ryan was referencing with the handbook. We have core values and, and student learning expectations. So those two things are very new. And I would like to thank the community. We had 511 responses in total giving us input on this process. And that was used by the 
NEASC steering committee, which is being chaired by Christian Basha and Megan Burke, who are doing an absolutely fabulous, fabulous job driving this whole process, okay? And of course, we always want to thank a big shout out to our PTO. They really, I don't know, I can't say enough about this group of people. They're just selfless, and they put together this activity. Mr. Marias was there showing his skill set. Mr. Lila was there. I mean, you start talking about the casino night and all the things they're trying to do to bring, um, you know, extra programming to the school. I just, I can't say enough about the PTO. From, from all the years I've ever been involved in Milford Public Schools, I'm always just so amazed. Um, and one thing we wanted to do is we're, we're going to be talking a little bit about standard one so the key to standard one is you know you're talking about your curriculum your planning and assessment so we focused on after we had our castle um, evaluation last year when we got their results we did some thinking we started talking about what we could do that's research based that would support the smoke <laughs> the social emotional needs of our students um, at the middle level that becomes very 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 important so we um, purchased something called the Second Step Curriculum, which is a research-based <coughs> curriculum. And there are five themes, and a lot of those themes certainly are addressing all the so social-emotional needs. We're trying to address some of the things that were highlighted as cri critical need in the Metro West survey, as well as the Castle assessment that took place in our district. Okay. So we need to introduce that to the faculty. And, you know, when we have, how are we going to do this? If you take a look at, we have action steps, timeline, personal responsible for resources needed, but also the measure of success, meaning how, how are we checking to see if we're doing what we're saying we're doing. So what we wanted to do is be very specific with the measures of success on how we're going to rate ourselves. The next column is the alignments to our evaluation tool that we're governed by in the state, but also what we follow as a district that was collaborated, collaborated on. Uh, with the union and then the next item is new is the alignment to the 214 NIAS standards for accreditation so you'll see there's a standard and, I and an item number so that's the difference of what I usually come with okay you guys and then we tried to put in a budget impact as well so next year the focus is only going to be on theme one which is empathy and communication which is really an important thing why is it important to be nice why is it important to listen or communicate about how you're feeling I know many of adults you know sometimes we don't communicate as well as we should I me included so I think when we start talking about how can we foster growth for our students using this research-based curriculum is going to be helpful and then we're going to try to bring that as a theme to the uh, faculty and staff. So on June 1st, we have our SIP, SISP people, which is guidance, adjustment counselor, team chair, nurses, blah, 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 all of that. They're going to be working on a professional day to say, hey, how are we going to, how can we roll this out so it's really effective? How can we utilize the S period and ASC for social? Um, how can we deliver this so it's not, a, it's not stressful for everybody, but it becomes a really purposeful school community approach? Um, so that's going to happen over a period of time. Uh, that's the first part. Going to the second part of standard one, it's kind of supporting the 21st century student learning expectations. And we need to create a measurement for each of those learning expectations identified on the items listed in page three, okay? So basically what we did was we had a conversation with the gal from NEASC, Dr. Montagano, and she really encouraged us to take a look at what Milford High School did and try to lead into what they're doing so it becomes a seamless transition vertically into um, learning expectations, the rubrics and style of how they're doing those. So it becomes a little bit easier for the parents to understand as they go from middle school to high school. So we are trying to do that. So that's a big piece of what we're going to be identifying in the future, uh, especially next year. Okay. And then we're going to have to make sure we do a good job making sure the kiddos know how to understand that as well as the families. Then the next step would be adding it to the report card and then making sure we implement it in the report card structure so people understand it. And you might say, how, how are we going to do that, Nancy? Well, for example, not every department is going to be measuring every learning expectation. For example, you know, uh, ELA and reading might do one learning expectation and be responsible for reporting that out on the report card. And then PE and health might be responsible for the other thing, and we're going to split it out that way. Okay, everyone? Is, does anyone have any questions so far? Okay. Um, the last thing in the standard one is kind of, it, it's this ongoing process. Curriculum is a living, breathing document, so we're really working 
and the central office has been wonderful, you know, trying to get us all to get on the same page with the UBD template. That it's it's a new thing for mo many of us, and um, we're going to have an upcoming training uh, next week to really try to help move that process along. And if everything goes well, we're all going to be done with that January 218 as a baseline. Okay. Um, also within that, we want to have. The just theme one, empathy and communication. How are we going to just embed that into our existing curriculum maps? So not to stress anyone <coughs> out, you might be like, oh my gosh, I'm going to fit another thing in. So not really. So in your target objective, I can, you know, whatever, write a fluent paragraph, blah, blah, within uh, utilizing character analysis, I'm going to consider how one character could be empathetic towards the other character and communicate those feelings, da, da, da. So, you can just embed the thought of or the vocabulary and then kind of reinforce it as you go through that series yeah. of curriculum. Okay? That's what we're thinking that that would be the less stressful thing and kind of integrating it into real world experience as you're, you're moving through your regular <coughs> curriculum. You guys, if you take a look, you'll see this is a three year plan I'm proposing. So only next year, theme one empathy and communication. The following year, we're going to build in theme two over a couple of months, then theme three in a couple of months, and slowly build that in until we get into the, the five themes so we're all on the same page. Um, the reason we decided to pick up the second step curriculum is because they are also picking that up in the elementary level, and we felt it would be a very good transitional piece vertically to connect the um, elementary to the high school through the middle. Um, standard two is the next item in, in that getting all the information about the second step to our students. So the measure of success, and we're holding ourselves to a high standard here, is at the conclusion of the fi uh, five lessons, a grade level assembly is going to take place and we're expecting that 80% or more of our students are going to demonstrate growth in their ability to define empathy and communication and make connections to the real world and that would be measured by a pre and post uh, assessment and that is what the committee is going to start to try. How are we going to do that? You know how <laughs> lucky we are. We have a staff member, Dr. Bradica, who is a, a product of the Milford Public Schools who is skilled in um, this program and she has agreed to become the school-based trainer for us. So we already have that. So people might be like, how are you going to pay for that, Nancy? Uh, we're really lucky that she's already agreed to do that in unison with me. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. And we have a lot of skilled counselors and they're ready to jump on board. The really, the big thing, and I'm sorry I'm being winded, um, the big thing I wanted to talk with you about is if you look all the way to um, the budget impact, and it's not really a budget impact because we're already starting to think about it and we already pre-purchased some things. I just really want to highlight this cool, this coolness, I love it. It's an interdisciplinary idea that came up with Second Step. So we're always saying, great, we're going to implement it, we're going to talk, we're going to embed it in our curriculum maps. But the next step is how are we going to do this so it's going to be exciting for the students so it takes hold. So I did some talking with uh, Mrs. Wilson, our theater teacher and our music teacher and uh, Mrs. Salman, our art teacher. Mrs. Salman just f finished a master's degree and she just came back from a seminar in New York on puppets for social justice. So she brought the puppet down, blah, 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 joking with me and I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. So then I went down to Karen. If you can remember, because of the eighth grade transition, eighth grade never had a general music program. They now do. So we talked a lot about it in the transition committee and we said, how can we make this eighth grade class more real world? So what the kids were doing is a lot of video, a lot of acting out things, really kind of, you know, I don't know if you saw the claymation things I was tweeting at some point. So what we're going to do and what we're going to try to do, and I hope this works, is it's going to be really fun, is the art classes are going to make these puppets for social justice. The eighth grade music classes are going to create the skits using those puppets and they're going to focus on the theme of empathy and communication. Um, using those and that will be grade level assemblies and hopefully we're also going to be able to do a parent um, presentation as well if all goes well maybe at um, parent teacher conferences in December or another night that we set. All right, so that's, that's the thought behind trying to do something very different, very innovative, using technology, um, using uh, interdisciplinary connections to make it more real for the students, okay? Uh, and then you can see we keep building from theme to theme, month to month, adding, just adding a little bit more, adding a little bit more, maybe every three or four months adding another theme. But next year, 
just one theme, theme one, empathy and communication all year. Because we really want the teachers to be able to focus on completing those UBD templates by um, January, okay? So that, you know, that goes, that goes. So we're on standard three now, uh, focusing on the statement, we are better together. Uh, Stacy Middle School would really like to increase working in the development and trusting partnerships with family and community members. Um, so again, we're gonna be introducing second step to curriculum and family. Doing an overview, we'll probably offer it at an evening. Perhaps we can offer it at a back to school night session. There's so many parents that are there and it's a really great environment. It's a happy environment that night always. We might offer a component um, visit, uh, maybe during the specialist time so they can get a, a picture of what that may look like. I don't know, we have to figure out how that's gonna work. That's what the committee's gonna try to be figuring out um, on June 1st, okay? And then um, we're hoping the kids from the music classes will be able to do the assembly for parents at some point as well, if they'd like to see that. The next thing in terms of standard three about we are always better together is there's been some signage that has been formatted with um, a company in town that I tend to utilize for visuals within our school building. And the signage is gonna be added in the main office area. You guys know when you walk in into the check-in booth, <coughs> there's a piece of wall that goes up right to the right of the checkup book, uh, booth. That's where we're gonna be putting um, kind of like in grayish lettering to pick up the ambiance of Stacy Middle School. You know, I like that. Um, welcome in every language that comes into Stacy Middle School and it's going to be right there. So mm. we're trying to really open up saying welcome and even if it's one little word someone can say, you know, you're like, hey, this is really important. I feel like someone's making an effort. So that's going to be put in place hopefully um, by the end of the summer for incoming families, okay? Um, standard four. This is professional culture, so we're looking for teachers to be able to participate in a flexible sort of professional development pathway that's going to integrate the social and emotional competencies that I've talked to you about with the curriculums, but also all the standard professional development programming people need to do for recertifications. And lastly, also all the things that we're identifying in our self-assessment currently as we move through now, and how can we utilize the self the self-assessment identifying areas of need that are gonna meet the needs of the accreditation process. So what we do is that that's like kind of like a, this really global, flexible thing that we wanna do. And me and um, Central Office, particularly Craig, kind of started this down at Woodland and that's where I kind of, you know, I'm like, that's really a great idea, Craig. On Tuesdays, you give flexible days where people can do and pick what they wanna do. So I'm trying to come up with some sort of pathway, a couple of pathways where if, you know, take this or you can take that or you can take this, I really need this or I really need that. And we have a lot of really, really talented in-house people. I mean, seriously talented. So there's a lot of people who are willing to do those trainings. So kind of trying to make that, um, flexible somehow and available over Tuesdays, every Tuesday over the month if people are able to do it. So that's something that, you know, that's, I don't know how, I'm, that's a huge thing and to, glo you know, try to conceptualize how that's going to happen. We would like that to happen. That's what we're going to try to focus on. So we're, I would say, differentiating for our own faculty yeah. like we try to do for our students because that's equally important. And um, that's that in a half. All right. So it, obviously you covered a lot there and <laughs> open up to the, the committee. Does anyone have any questions on the improvement plan? All right, Mr. Chairman, sure. So thank you both for coming in. I know that, um, uh, Nancy, you've, you've been coming in front of us for many years as, uh, as a teacher. It's good to see you, Mr. McHale, coming in front of right, us and certainly continuing to build your career here. I, I know not always the most fun thing a teacher can do is come in front of the school committee, so I do appreciate you, and I know you have some other uh, support folks that are here as mm -hmm. well for that are going to be on the agenda later on. So, thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, my question is going to be, and it's more just a, as we continue as we go through, and, and just in full disclosure, it's going to be a question I'm going to continue to have as we go through, which is the piece I'd like for us to think about. And this is I'm not looking for a response now. Mm -hmm. This is just as we go forward. The ongoing question is going to be: so with this, with a school improvement plan, is how do we know it's working? How do we know that last year's plan was effective and what was the point-to-point -point measurement we used yeah. to show that it's moving forward? So one of the questions that was asked last time is, is you know, what are, we, what are we using for benchmarks? What do we want to see as far as progress? Mm -hmm. So the good news is, is you actually mentioned all four of them and I, meant, and I wrote them down, so thank you. Which is, 
the improvement, and so there's a lot of focus around the Metro West Health Survey. How are our results continuing to improve? What's, what are the things that are, are approaching this that are gonna continue to improve this? Mm -hmm. and, what's, and how do we know it worked? The NEASC components. Mm -hmm. NEASC has asked us to do things. How do we know that it's working? How do we know that they're moving forward? MCAS scores, always a constant benchmark. That's what's mm -hmm. one of the things that's a measurement that's part of our report card as a school system. Sure, sure. Um, how do we know that the school improvement plans are relating and how do we know, how do we see the improvements? Mm -hmm. And that's a, a specific <coughs> metric that we can obviously look at. And then obviously the DESE, right? So DESE gives us a report card by school. We certainly have heard a lot about that earlier this week through our interview process. Um, how do we continue to see those results? And again, comparing, connecting the school improvement plan to, okay, so I'm, I put together a plan and you put together a lot and it's very comprehensive. How do we see, and each of these, of these standards touches in each of these categories. Mm -hmm. The ask, Kevin, is going to be, how do we know that it's worked? Mm -hmm. What were the results prior to the improvement plan? What were the results mm -hmm. post the improvement plan? What are the benchmarks and milestones that we're using along the way mm -hmm. to know that that actually worked? And again, I'm not looking for a response now. I can it's, give you one if you like. I'm not looking for okay. one now. No, I appreciate that because okay. I here's the reason why I'm asking each of the principals as we go through this piece, mm -hmm. it, and it's I I don't it's not fair for me to put you guys on the spot. So I don't mm -hmm. want to do that, and I don't want any teacher any principal that coming in thinking that we're going to put them on the spot. That's not the intent. Um, but if we can make sure as we're going through throughout next year, not just when the presentation comes through, how do we know it's making it better? What are, yep. the, what are the things that we can point to that said, this is what it says? And sometimes it's intangibles, and I understand that. Um, Scott, it sounds like you almost want a, an additional component document when we come to present the new one. We can present a finalized one with the measurement success listed on that. Is something? Probably for next year. Again, okay. not for this year's okay. plan. But um, one of the things that I'm, ask, that I'm, that I'm asking for is, is, yes, certainly next year. That would be phenomenal. Um, what are the milestone achievements throughout the year? How do we know, without waiting until next May, almost June, that it worked? Mm -hmm. How do we course correct if it's not on target? What sure. are the things that we're using for benchmarking that and measuring this as we go along? Mm -hmm. And we're gonna, uh, do you mind if I jump in? Joe? No, go ahead. We're gonna, we're gonna add that to our, um, we do an administrative retreat every summer. We're gonna add that agenda into our retreat in terms of how do we structure um, the school improvement plan presentation so there's consistency. I'm not sure if you guys got this or not. We did send an electric, um, electronic thing about school improvement planning accomplishments for 1617 mm -hmm. for your review as well. Um, in addition to that, certainly I think what you're saying is a really good point, and it's only going to help us get better if we measurement and, and kind of do it like a uh, student learning or professional practice goal with benchmarks. It's almost like an educator plan for the school improvement plan. It sounds like what you're asking for. Yeah, it's, okay. you know, we give students report cards. We give them grades throughout mm -hmm. the semester so they know yeah. how they're doing. They take tests, they take quizzes, they hand in homework assignments. Students know how they're doing um, all the way along. We give report cards out on a trimester so that that way they know how they're doing that throughout the year. We get a report card as a school district. Sure. It'd be nice to know how we're doing on our grades. It shouldn't be a surprise party. Mm -hmm. um, it, it shouldn't be a surprise party for any of us. It shouldn't be a surprise party for the public either. And how do we make sure that we're supporting, and again, this all comes from a place of support. How can we as a school committee continue to support as we have always? How, do we, how can we continue to support this yeah. and the initiatives that are going on in these schools? And how do we know mm -hmm. that what we're going in and where we're going to support, because we go through budget time and say, mm -hmm. great, and we certainly trust the, the impacts and the questions that are coming in, mm -hmm. but it's our decision. We're charged with policy and budget are our two primary components. Mm -hmm. The policies we create and the budget that we form and present are there to help support the schools. This is the report card that tells us, are we, are we putting our efforts in the right place? And that, right. Helps, that will help us make a, hopefully an even more informed decision. And it's a long process, as you are well aware. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's all I have. Yep. And, and, and to, to Kevin's point, it's important that we be consistent right across all the, the schools, so uh, working on that project at the retreat makes makes a lot of sense. And we recognize that a, a lot of the, these things that, that you implement are gonna take time to, to show results, right? Mm -hmm. So I implementing um, whatever it may be, a, math, a new math curriculum isn't gonna have an impact in year one on math test scores, right? But we'll, hopefully we'll see it in year two, year three, year four. Yeah. So yeah. we don't necessarily make decisions from year to year based on the results, but something yeah. we wanna monitor to see over time. Yeah. It no, it's, it's, it's making it's, I think an it's, impact. it's a really, it's really good feedback. It's a good point. It's a great point. Yeah, and, and, and I will say that um, 
to Scott's point, this is probably one of the more comprehensive plans that we've seen. Um, mm -hmm. And I really like the, the layout. I don't know if this is the template that you've leveraged from another no, from we other kinda, groups or we kinda, developed on your we own. Did it. They're actually, with your permission, mm -hmm. I asked Dr. McIntyre, NIASC has asked if they can use us as a model. Yeah, because it, it, the way it's laid out, it has very clear action plans, uh, action steps, timeline, how are you going to measure the success, to Scott's point, mm -hmm. and there's a number of different ways you can measure success, and, and more specifically, how it's aligned to the standards and to, to, to NEASC. So uh, I really like the layout and even added the budget impact in here as well. Um, so this could be a good foundation for other schools as well, and then <coughs> depending upon the outcome from the retreat, we can certainly add, add to it, but I really like the the layout and how clear Thank the you. plan is. I, we appreciate that. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you. Anything else? Uh, any no, other questions? No? All right. Do I have a motion to approve this Stacy Middle School improvement plan? Motion from Scott, seconded by John. All in favor? All right. Thank, nice you. Job. Thank, Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <coughs> So our, our next agenda item is the, the policy readings. Um, you know, Jen was going to take the lead on that. She's not here yet. So um, do you want to pass it over? Do you, do you want it? We can jump in if you want to jump in. We can wait for her to come back if you want to. Yeah, why don't, why don't we give her a little bit of time? We have a couple other things to, to cover here as well. Um, so then the, the next agenda item is the, the town meeting article on <coughs> books. Um, <coughs> So, the as you know, this, the finance committee approved our article um, for roughly six hundred thousand dollars to fund Chromebooks for grades six through twelve yep. last week. Um, the the chairman of the finance committee reached out and asked us if we if we had any flexibility with the the, the Chromebook proposal. Um, he felt that from a financial perspective, it was going to put the town in, in a tough spot and inquired as to whether or not we'd be willing to move forward with grades six through nine in the spring, and they would fund those Chromebooks, and then defer 10 through 12 to the fall when free cash has been certified. They have a better understanding as to where uh, the town stands in terms of, of free cash, and at that point, if the funding's there, um, we would submit another article for grades 10 through, through 12. Um, we had a conversation with the, the administration about it as well, and. Um, felt that um, that's something we should, certainly could consider. It would, it would certainly provide or alleviate uh, some of the stress that's, stress that's going to be put on the resources over the course of the summer to roll out these Chromebooks. Um, and most importantly, from, from the, I don't want to speak for you, but from the administration's perspective, um, getting Chromebooks in the hands of the sixth graders that are transitioning from Woodland and getting Chromebooks in the hands of the ninth graders who are going to be the first class to take the MCAS electronically in 2018 um, was really where the, where the biggest priority was at the moment. Um, and waiting a, a few additional months to get 10 through 12 really wouldn't set us back all that much. And it, in fact, it would give our resources a little bit more time to roll out the Chromebooks uh, effectively. Um, so I want to open up to the committee, see if anyone has any, any questions or concerns <coughs> about potentially um, splitting it and doing six through nine in the spring and then 10 through 12 in the fall or potentially next spring. Can I just make one correction yeah. to that, Joe? Um, just so nobody panics out there, especially the high school faculty that's listening. It's actually 2019 is the first year. Sorry. The Chromebooks, <laughs> are, the, Chrome, the electronic testing. I saw Mary kind of <coughs> react, react, react visually when you said 2018. It's, Sorry it's about actually that. 2019. <laughs> just said 55 high school teachers fall out of their chairs at home. Right. Uh, and two in but the other, But other than that, it's 100% you know, accurate. Okay. So any, any questions or concerns? About pension from that back, John. Yeah, I have a number of questions and concerns. The first one, from a financial perspective, um, this is something that we put forward to come out of free cash. Something that the finance committee um, did support recently, uh, as recently as a week or so ago. So I guess I'd want some more clarification if that's the reason that we're not going to go forward with it. The, you know what the financial impact is and what the concern is today that that wasn't there a week ago, because my understanding is. Um, that free cash is available on it, and um, there's no there's no real effect to the town um, by by either going forward in full now or going in full in part now and in part in the fall. Um, but more than that, I'd like to hear more about the concerns from the administration because uh, this is something we've been talking about and planning for, and 
and pushing for for uh, since budget season began uh, early this winter. And um, I'd like to know what's changed in the last week that's making us reconsider this article. So I, I can I can answer the um, the kind of ability to roll out. I would say we'd have the ability to roll out. Um, six through eight or six through twelve, I think flawlessly. I think last year we we were able to, um, you know, and this was the first our first go at it at Woodland. Um, mm -hmm. They were able to roll out three through five, and basically the number of Chromebooks at Woodland is pretty similar to the number that would be at Stacy. The high school is a little higher, but not not demonstrably so. Um, from my perspective, I think if we look at where we were last year. Um, at this, at maybe maybe like last September in 2016, to where we'll be in you know the opening of school in 2017, we're going from a district that had um, limited connectivity in some of the buildings to fully wireless and fully wireless capability. Of, you know from pre-K to 12. Um, this year we have Chromebooks in three through five. Next year we'll be able to roll it out. You know either you know depending on what the committee says, either six through nine or, s or six through 12. Um, the critical piece for me is to have the Chromebooks in the hands of the ninth graders at the high school. Um, obviously, it's a great resource for all the high school students, but we want our, high, our ninth graders specifically to be able to have a year and probably three quarters practice with the, with the devices in hand so they're prepared to take the test. Um, I don't think it's going to have a huge educational impact if we get the remaining devices in, say, say at the October town meeting. And I, I think it, um, you know, it certainly demonstrates uh, collaboration and, and cooperation and flexibility on, on our part to, to defer a portion of the, the Chromebooks. Um, you know, I, I, I know we've we've talked about this a lot, but obviously over the summer we're going to be building out the infrastructure here at the high school, right? So that's going to be one project. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be rolling out Chromebooks potentially six through nine or, or six through through twelve. We have a new principal that's coming on board at the high school mm -hmm. as well. I, I just I think if we focus on six through nine at the beginning of the school year, or over the summer at the beginning of the school <laughs> year, and then 10 through 12, hopefully sometime after October town meeting and you know, December, January time frame, um, I don't think that's going to put us back. Um, and it, it kind of demonstrates some, fl some flexibility on, on our part as well. So, um, If I could, I'm just, I'm just not hearing any concrete justification on why we're not moving forward. With, with a plan that we've been working hard on to see if, if we can afford it as a community to move forward and ask town meeting to support this. Um, I'm, I'm hearing bits and pieces of some sort of justification on why not to go forward, um, but I'm, I'm just I'm not understanding why we put so much time, so much effort into seeing if we could afford it, seeing what the benefits would be, coming up with you know a three-pronged plan of either rolling out complete, in half or a third a third and a third um, I'm just not, I'm just not coming away from this conversation with with a reason not to roll them out um, so, not, not to roll them out if we can get town meeting support um, when that's been the argument for a long time and and I'm not seeing what financially is the difference between um, uh, getting the money appropriated from free cash now or doing it partially now and partially in October. I'm, I'm honestly I'm looking for a better explanation on why we're changing it our, our direction at the 11th hour and, and if it's not there it's not there but that's yeah that's so my mindset. John I just want to be clear we have full capability to roll it out from 6 to 12 and, and you know Dr. Joseph kind of he kind of lined up basically the three plans you talked about a six through 12 full rollout, uh, uh, basically a, a third, a third, a third rollout, and then the uh, six, eight, <coughs> followed by a nine, 12 rollout based on, based on school. Um, my response to it is it was a request of the um, chair of the finance committee making, um, based on financial concerns about free cash. And, and, and the response is we're trying to be flexible in terms of putting it in the hands immediately of the critical, um, the students who need it critically, the sixth grade students will be taking the MCAS online this upcoming year. And who, 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 um, the eighth grade took it this past year as a, as a pilot year, which was the request of the Department of Education. And then giving the opportunity to the ninth graders to, to practice it puts us in a good spot. Um, the Chromebook's a fantastic tool. Um, 
you know, obviously we, we want all of our students to have access to um, the very best tools educationally, but I think it's not really going to put us backwards, and if it potentially supports the town financially, which was the request that was made, um, it's hard for me to argue against that. But I also hear your argument saying, you know, if we've got the, the approval already, why aren't we doing the full rollout? Yeah, the, the, well, the only real financial argument there is that um, should there be an unforeseen event over the summer, right, between the spring town meeting and the fall town meeting. Um, if we defer a portion of it, there's additional funds that they could potentially tap into to address that unforeseen financial situation. But it, as you know, it's probably unlikely. So the money will most likely be there in the, in the fall. Um, so really, we're, we're only deferring it a few, in my, in my opinion, a few months. Um, but I, obviously, we all have different opinions. So. And it, it's difficult to, for me to argue against it because right. it's something that I very much fought for. Yeah, it, it is something that the entire, well, I don't want to say the entire, but the administration did fight for. Absolutely. It, it's something, if you if you look at town finances, if we hold back on it, it's not like the money's just there at whim. It, you know, if there's an unforeseen circumstance um, and money needs to be spent, whether it's from free cash or, or um, stabilization, it needs to go to town meeting. Um, we know that town meeting, May 22nd, come June 30th, this free cash is no longer available. Um, at this 11th hour, I'd really like to see some sort of a justification for this request. Um, and it's, again, something's changed drastically if this is a request from the request change from last week till now. Um, and my question is, what are we leaving on the table? You know, we're better off with the Chromebooks. If our plan is to go forward in October, this is essentially the same free cash in October that would, that would be, you know, um, appropriated now. I'm, I'm just looking for some sort of a justification or an answer on this. And aside from the fact that we can do it and we're willing to, I get that. I'm willing to. I just, I just wish there was. I wish there was something more that I could um, wrap my arms around on this concept. Any other questions or comments or concerns? Just that. You know, I and I hear what you, I hear what you're saying, John. As far as you know, what's changed over the course of the week, um, and I I can't answer that question. I think any better than anybody else here can. I, I think. My view on it personally is um, my responsibility as a school committee member is to the school budget and to the students in the town of Milford. And we've fought really hard and worked really collaboratively to try and get this funding approved um, and to be able to go forward with that. That being said, we're also part of a larger community. Um, I, I, I couldn't tell you what every other board in town is doing from a finance perspective. That's what the finance committee is there for. At the end of the day, um, the Finance Committee Chairman has asked us if we would be willing to consider this. Um, I, I have to trust in his judgment because he has far better view into all of the overall town budget in every single department, far better purview than I do. Um, if it's not going to be educationally detrimental to our students, I'm very comfortable with, at the recommendation and at the request of the Finance Committee Chairman, saying, listen, there, I've, got to I've got to trust that there's bigger things moving and there's other moving pieces that I'm not privy to and that I can't see. Okay, if, if that be the case, I, I trust your judgment and, and we're all one community and if that's what you're asking for and it's not gonna educa educationally hurt our students, then I would feel comfortable with moving forward to it. I have to trust other departments. I'm not gonna question the police, the, the police chief's budget because I don't know it. I, I can't I can't I can't trust those other ones. I, but again, I I hear what you're saying. We fought for. Can we go through it? I don't know what the justification is. But but I'm not asking either. So I guess. John, I, I just want to make the distinction though that this is different than the police budget, our own budget, highway budget. This is this is a free cash item. Mm -hmm. This if we delay it until fall, this is still a free cash item. This is the yeah. same cash. Um, I can't imagine that we're going to unroll Chromebooks half of them now and not move forward. Because if we fast forward a year, that, that would be saying this freshman that has them come this fall won't have them uh, the following fall. So I, I just, again, I, I am definitely a big advocate of working within what the community can afford. I've, I've said it during budget meetings in front of the Finance Committee. I'm not here to fight just for the school and, and not look at the, the bigger picture of mm -hmm. we are one community and, and what our levy limit is and everything else. I'm just not, I'm just not seeing any difference this is this is to me um, if we're gonna go forward with full Chromebooks it, it's now or later out of the same 
pile of money, so to speak. So I, I again, I, I don't, I don't say I'd oppose this. I think it's somewhat detrimental to the students, but for the greater good of, of the community, I would support it. I just need to see what that greater good is, and I'm not seeing it. And, and, and you know, to, to your point, ideally the concerns would have been brought up at the finance committee meeting last week, right? As opposed to being unanimous, unanimously approved. Um, but they they, they they weren't. But that that said, um, you know, they also were supportive of our operating budget. And to your point, I know it's two different things, um, but we did have finance committee members that advocated on, on our behalf to support our budget. Um, and again, I, th I think it is important to, so we've had some difficult conversations with the finance committee over the last couple months, right? And I think we all recognize that. And I think this shows that if people are willing to put the egos aside and collaborate, that you know, we can reach compromises as opposed to always digging our heels in on things. So. Um, you know, again, I don't think it's going to set us back in any way from an education perspective because we're really not talking about a long time frame here. Um, so I think it's it's worth making that that compromise, in my in my opinion. And I'll just add, if it's probably not putting us back any further educationally, much further, because it would. I, I don't know that anybody here would say it wouldn't be more of a benefit to have them all now, but I'm not seeing any justification on how it's putting us in a better spot financially um, if we're going to push this off until October. If we're going to pass it over forever, I get it. That changes our finances. But um, So I won't belabor this any longer, but those are, those are my thoughts. Those are my questions, some which have not been answered, but um, we can move forward can with I this discussion. Is it, is it something that we can have uh, um, the chair of the FinCom explain to like, us exactly why? Like I, I know we're hearing it. But the reason, hey, John, we see this, there's going to be a problem here potentially. That's why we're doing this. Yeah. Well, yeah. Is there like someone that, like an yeah, email? The meeting's Monday. The, ch the right. challenge is it's Monday. We have, right. We have right. It's now Monday, Thursday. So we, we need okay. to make a decision Cause, today. Right. Because I, I totally, I'm hearing John's point, and, and I agree with John to a point, and, and I agree to Scott. It, it, it seems weird because it was a unanimous vote. Everyone said, yes, let's go. But the next day, it's, well, whatever. I get it. It's fine. It's their, That's their job to manage the money. My job, our job, is to make sure these kids get their education. If it's only going to be a couple months, that's fine. But it, I agree with John and Scott and both of them. I'm at the will of the committee, I'll, I'll go with whatever. To be sort of clear, I don't think that Scott and I are necessarily disagreeing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're actually <laughs> yeah, just have yeah. some, you're you're both both saying, yeah, we don't understand it. <laughs> some questions. We just have some that's questions. Uh, but again, I may have more questions than Scott. <laughs> that's all. No, and they're, and they're all valid <laughs> questions, John. They, 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 they absolutely No are. kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a change. <laughs> So we, we obviously do, do have a decision to make here. Um, so do, 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 is there, do I have a motion to um, move make a motion forward that we move forward with the um, six through nine um, funding, and we delay the other half until um, we mend the we mend the article to delay the other half of funding and seek that at the fall town special town meeting. Okay. I'll second that. Point of, point of order, um, I guess. I think we need to put a dollar amount on it to if yeah. we're if we're going to change our article that's been put in place now and if we need a dollar amount tonight to bring forward to town council to put on the warrant or not the warrant but um to the put on the floor there. yeah so the, the the dollar amount for grades six through nine would be three hundred eighty five thousand dollars so i'll, I'll amend my yep I'll, so i'll amend my motion um i, I my motion includes the the funding dollar amount of three hundred eighty five thousand dollars okay and is there a I'll second second, that was seconded joke. by joe all in favor So five in favor. That was a heavy hand, baby. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, all right. <coughs> and you'll have to connect with I will. Jerry. Tomorrow, I, yeah. 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 All right. The next agenda item we have is a report of the assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction, the uh, Math Pathways Program. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've asked uh, Andrea Rhoda, who's the 6th through 8th Math CTL, and Mary Casello, the high school Math CTL, to be here. Uh, we have a presentation that we're going to, to give to the middle school parents, and just the outline for the middle school parents, uh, what happens in the middle school and how it affects kids as they go through the high school. 
just to be totally clear and, and for parents to understand. We, we intend the presentation to be about a half hour, 45 minutes. Not today, though. Just right. <laughs> safe. Thank you. We're going to give you the Cliff Notes version. Um, so I'll just start with goals. The, uh, the goals of the middle school math program, and we, we felt it was very important to lay out these goals just for, for parents to see. This is what we need all of our middle school kids to feel about math. So number one, increase students' confidence in their ability to learn new math concepts. Uh, provide students with problem-solving skills to figure out answers to complicated problems. Offer a program that is differentiated to meet the needs of the various learners. Uh, provide access to high school level courses for students who demonstrate readiness for an accelerated program. Uh, and that's important, we'll talk about that at, in a minute. And to continue to build the foundational skills necessary for all students to be college and career ready. Um, if you, you have the packets in front of you, so if you skip the couple pages, um, we're on the overview of the math programming in the, the middle school. I'll, I'll turn it over to Andrea for that. Uh, and then she'll just kind of briefly go over each grade level for you. All right. So in sixth grade, there all the students are heterogeneously grouped, and the core math teacher is differentiating the instruction for the students, you know, offering reteaching enrichment within the core classroom. In seventh grade, the students have three different levels of math. They're all using the exact same book. They're all using the Math Accelerated Program from Glencoe. But there's an honors class, there's, uh, which is considered significantly above grade level. There's a CP class, and they used the word CP only to match the high school courses. I mean, we all agreed it's somewhat of a misnomer. We didn't like the idea of labeling a, labeling a class CP, because that insinuates, obviously, that the core class is not, which is certainly not true. But the reason we called it CP was to mirror what the high school does with its levels of um, offerings in math. And then the essentials class is the grade level core common, state, common core state standard curriculum. And then eighth grade follows the same thing a little bit. But in eighth grade, we wanted more students to be able to take algebra one in grade eight. In the past, I think historically, it's only been 20 to 25% of our students take algebra one in grade eight. And we said, how can we increase that number to get more kids into higher level math in high school? So we, in uh, meeting with the teachers, we decided to offer Algebra 1 CP. The high school offers that. So why not in eighth grade have Algebra 1 honors and Algebra 1 CP? And then, of course, the grade level, grade eight Common Core State Standard curriculum. So that's the different offers. And Backtracking on that, when we decided we wanted to try and get more kids into Algebra 1 in Grade 8, that's what came to the decision that we needed to have an accelerated program in Grade 7 available mm -hmm. in order to get more kids ready for Algebra 1 in Grade 8. Okay. What's the percentage this year, uh, Andrea? We, I haven't got those numbers officially back. Roughly. I think it's 50% in the core program, about 25% in Algebra 1 CP, and about 25% in Algebra 1 Honors. So that's huge, because in the past, we've only had about 20 25% of our kids in Algebra 1 in Grade so 8. So we basically tripled it in two years. Well, doubled. Well, we have about 50% of our kids okay, in Algebra 1. Okay. Mm -hmm. Doubled in two years is pretty phenomenal. <coughs> yeah. Gotcha. And, and looking towards the future, we're thinking, we're thinking about two-thirds is a, is a pretty fair bet of where we want to be, two-thirds of our students. And, and just to reiterate something for uh, Andrea, it's important that, that families know when you get into the algebra, the high school algebra in eighth grade, you still have to cover the eighth grade standards. So part of what's happening in seventh grade is they're compacting some of the eighth grade standards in that accelerated course into seventh grade and then also teaching some of those eighth grade standards in the eighth grade course as well as the high school algebra. So if kids aren't ready for that accelerated path, we would be foolish to force them into it because basically they're taking three years of math in two years. So they have to really be ready for it and they have to really love math and, and want to be on that path, that accelerated path. So we want that challenge. We talked about in some ways the grade eight algebra one, 
even though it's following the same curriculum, I believe, yeah. as the ninth grade one, it's actually a little bit more challenging because on top of those Algebra One standards that they're covering, they're also compacting in the right. eighth grade Common Core State standards so that the kids are getting those as well. A perfect example of that is geometry. In the Common Core State standards for eighth grade, there's a lot of geometry, but in Algebra One, there isn't a ton of geometry. So the eighth grade teachers have to get that in so those kids are prepared for the right. state tests and they're prepared for geometry as a freshman. And they also do some statistical inference in those state standards too that we don't necessarily cover in our Algebra One uh, courses. Okay, so um, the next couple pages covers, you know, what is the sixth grade math program, and then the critical areas of focus for grade six math, saying by the end of grade six, our, all of our students should definitely have these power standards under their belt. And then from sixth to seventh grade, so sixth grade, everybody's heterogeneous, and then in seventh grade, there's three different course offerings. So how do the teachers decide where students go? So we have three different criteria, um, not in any particular order. First on here is the placement test. So this test has been around for a while. The kids, all the sixth grade students, they take this test in the spring. And we analyze the results of the test to determine their readiness for an accelerated program in grade seven. Um, the teachers also, of course, look at the students' class performance, you know, their test average, their class average, and then the teacher recommendation part, you know, the students' motivation, the students' you know, interest in math. And all of that goes together, and they recommend what level the student will be in in grade seven. And that is flexible. You know, we always tell there is movement in the fall if a student is suddenly has an epiphany and is taking off in math, of course, the teacher will reevaluate and move that child into a, the appropriate program. If the avert, reverse happens, a child was put in honors and they're just not cutting it and it starts to be detrimental, we don't want a child to fail, mm. then the child will be moved into their appropriate class. And we, the kids know that, there's flexibility. Andrea, do you find, um, so are, are there students that might have the class average above a 90, but maybe they, they bomb the placement test and get a 70 on the placement test. So does the teacher then have some discretion to decide, okay, th this, this child is ready for it? Or? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is it works the other way. A child in sixth grade could easily have a class, a, a report card grade of 90, where the teacher has that child after school three, four days a week and lets the child retake tests or do what we call test corrections and is really encouraging and motivating that child but knows, yes, you have a class average of 90, but we really don't think that you're ready for the honors level yet. You know, let's put you in CP or even essentials in grade seven and see where you go, you know. So that plays into it too, because I get that kind of a phone call where parents say, I don't understand, my child has, had a solid 90 on their report card all year, but you're recommending seventh grade essentials or seventh grade CP, why not honors? It's not just the placement test, it's not mm. just the class average, it's not just one thing, it's yeah. the big picture of the child altogether. Okay. Yeah. I think we place a lot of value on the teacher recommendation piece, mm -hmm. more so than the pencil and paper assessment. Okay. Yeah. One thing I wanna reinforce too is, is we're getting a lot of well, some, I don't want to say a lot. And I think you probably feel these questions too, but, but parents who feel like there's a misconception that the pre-algebra essentials class is somehow below grade level when the, the reality is the essentials courses in seventh grade and eighth grade are the, the grade level course. But it, it feels almost like it's below grade level because we offer these other accelerated programs. But the reality is those essentials courses are the grade level course so yeah that's one call I get a lot from parents as the CTL saying why was my child put in the low class I'm like no, we don't have a low class there's no. no low classes at Stacey we don't have it doesn't exist and just clearing up that confusion no. is you know a big thing for them and that's one of the reasons we wanted to have this math night too to make sure everybody who wants to come out in here and ask these questions can do that instead of making those individual phone calls and emails 
And you know, I'm just going to throw one thing out there. We, we, when did we start this kind of path? Was it a couple of years ago? Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that we've already seen tremendous results. I'm very Isn't pleased it? by that. It's awesome. But I want to, like, philosophically, I, I threw this out to the, the math department in the middle school, too, is we want students to challenge themselves, and we want students to push themselves. Um, but, you know, and Andrew made a great point, not to, the, not to the point where somebody's up crying every night because they can't manage it, but, I, but I'm for access to you know, the highest course possible. And, and, and I say that in any yeah. setting, and I think we're moving in that direction. So it makes me, it makes me, and I'm crying for a different reason mm -hmm. inside. And, and the key word there is access. We want everybody to have access to mm -hmm. it. Right? Yeah. yeah, and I think it's, it's just awesome. Um, so then it goes over the power standards for grade seven, and this is also for parents to know. By the end of grade seven, your child should be very secure in these four power standards. And then from seventh grade to eighth grade, the seventh grade teachers go through a very similar process of saying, okay, now these kids are going into grade eight. Am I going to recommend the high school algebra one honors class in grade eight? That's, that's a big undertaking. Or am I going to recommend the Algebra 1 CP? Or am I going to recommend the standard grade 8 curriculum for the student? And they have their requirements, and it's the same thing. There's flexibility. And then in grade 8, the big difference is there are <laughs> two books. So grade 7, all three levels are using the exact same book. In grade 8, the Algebra 1 classes are using the Algebra 1 textbook that the high school, high school uses. Right. The essentials class is using the Glencoe Course 3 Common Core State Standard Grade 8 level book. And then it goes the power standards for the Grade 8 curriculum, which of course the Algebra 1 students have to cover as well, even though they're also covering all the Algebra 1 standards that are required. And then from grade eight to grade nine, the math teachers again have to go through this whole thing about where students will be placed. It's a little bit different because the Algebra one students will either possibly be recommended to repeat Algebra one at the high school level if they weren't successful and not really strong and ready for a high school curriculum. Or they'll go into geometry as a freshman and a small percentage of kids will get recommended to double up their freshman year and take geometry and algebra too. Mm -hmm. And Mary can talk to you more about that. Right, so we, we put together um, three slides that uh, talk about where the essentials kids would be placed, where the algebra one CP kids would be placed, and where the honors algebra one kids would be placed. Um, so the next slide you have is for the algebra essentials. We don't have a placement test. There is no placement test at, at this point. Um, we are planning on working on working on that later in the spring, maybe in the summer, and incorporate that into the eighth grade uh, the following year. Um, but again, as I said, we, we rely heavily on teacher recommendation because they are with those students day in and day out. They see what they can do um, on a regular basis and we have them look at their class average. Now in terms of class average, I like to look at test averages, quiz averages versus um, homework, et cetera. Because as Andrea said, sometimes you have that kid that really is a, a plugs away, plugs away. Um, are they necessarily ready for the, for the fast paced abstract math that they could see in geometry? Um, so the Algebra Essential students have um, three courses that they could take at the high school. Um, they can take the Algebra Concepts class, um, which is um, an Algebra One course as well. Um, some of those students in that course also take our MCAS Remediation class uh, because they need more time working on the math to be successful. Um, most of those students um, will take the Algebra One CP. So we'll have a small handful taking the concepts. We'll have a um, majority of students taking the Algebra One CP. And then we will have the handful of students that are ready and committed to doing an Algebra One Honors at the high school. Um, their college prep um, students are on the, on the following page. Um, you know, we call them college prep courses but they're not stuck in that track. They can move on to the geometry honors. 
So again, if the teacher feels that they are uh, committed to a rigorous course, they could move on to geometry honors as a freshman as opposed to the CP. Um, I did put a bullet in there which talks about continuation in the honors track because there would be some content gaps from students taking the Algebra 1 CP to remaining in an honors track Algebra 2. And um, those would be addressed either by remediation over the summer or you know we could do something with the students to, to fill the gap. Um, and then we have our honors students, the Algebra 1 honors students coming from the eighth grade. There is a possibility, as Andrew said, that they would repeat the Algebra 1 honors uh, course at the high school. Um, they could move into the geometry CP if they have not been successful with the pace or the content in the Algebra 1 honors course. Um, they could take the geometry honors or, as she said, they could take two concurrently, the geometry honors and the Algebra 2 honors. And we do have most of those students that were taking the Algebra 1 honors doing that this year. Hmm. They've been doubling up. They've been doubling up. Right. Oh, good for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, Do you want to talk about the connected? Do you want me to talk a little Go bit ahead. about that? The other thing <laughs> that we have at Stacy, which I think is awesome with our new Glencoe program, is the online resource that came with it, the connected package. So every student has their ebook online. They have tutorials online. They have such a wealth of information. They have practice tests. They have reteaching. They have everything they could possibly want online for their program. And then we also have, in addition to that, a program called Alex. And it's an online math tutor program that gives them, each student little individual knowledge checks throughout the year and assesses where they are in their current level of understanding and what skills they're ready to work on next. So the kids can work on their Alex program to individually and independently foster their math learning and move forward. So that's giving all students access to the full rich curriculum on their own independently if they want. That's really cool. Great. Yeah, We've had a few sixth grade students who completed the sixth grade level Alex so we gave them access to the seventh grade level Alex, and we actually have, I think, two students right now working on eighth grade level Alex in sixth grade, which is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they can keep going. They can keep going, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. It goes all the way to 12. Mm -hmm. right. Any questions regarding the math program? I may just jump to Ms. Sherman. Yeah, so thank you, ladies, for coming in, and thank you for the presentation. So. Um, this is a piece that I'm, I'm pleased to see sort of the progression that's kind of going along with this. Just a couple of just, I want to make sure I have it straight in my head as well as some of the pieces when we get from the eighth grade to the high school, mm -hmm. sort of that, making that leap. So we sort of jump, up, jump ahead to those pages here. So if I'm looking at, I just want to make sure I'm reading it correctly. So I'm looking at the, the, the page that says eighth to ninth grade placement. I just want to make sure I'm on the right yeah. page here. Okay. So the eighth grade, uh, ninth grade uh, placement. So if I'm reading this correctly, so if I was in algebra or concepts um, and I got a class average of below 70. Right. If you were in the, uh, the algebra essentials. In yeah, grade the algebra eight, essentials. it's called essentials. In grade nine, it's called concepts. concepts. Got it, okay. Right. So if I'm in eighth grade and I've got, a, if I'm in essentials right. and I get below a 70. Then your best recommendation is to take our algebra concepts. Got it. Yes. Okay, and that's what I just wanted to make sure is is that we're all on the same page here and that we're going. Okay. Mary, would those students generally also engage with the MCAS course as well? There, most of those students are in the MCAS remediation class okay. as well. Great. Yeah, you um, meant, you touched on that. We we did not have a grade nine remediation class this year, but next year we do have quite a few students that have been recommended from the eighth grade to take the remediation course. This year we had the MCAS 10 remediation. So is the reason for that because the scores were better and they, this, their students did not need the support? Or, well, be, or we, for we, whether there another We did have reason? a ninth grade class that was supposed to move forward. Yeah. Um, I think the feeling was that we need to continue working with these 10th grade students that it took, just took the exam 
a couple of days ago. Okay. Um, and so the ninth grade students had to forego that and they took another elective and we kept the 10th grade students and continued to reinforce concepts for their MCAS course. So I guess my question is, is why wouldn't we have just had both sets? Why wouldn't we have done both? My, here's my concern. I hear you and I'm actually very pleased to hear that we continue to support those 10th graders that still need the extra support. I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned we punted on ninth graders. And I, for, for the most part, that was not a math department decision. That okay. was an administrative decision. And I, we did not have the staff to accommodate a ninth grade class as well as the 10th grade. Okay. So. Um, I will say the students that were in ninth grade yep. also had science remediation. Yep. Because of the biology MCAS that's coming up early June. Yeah. So they continued with that versus going on an every other day basis. They continued with the science remediation throughout the course of the spring. All right, so I, I, I won't belabor that necessarily here this evening. Um, I'm going to give a little precluder to a future agenda item. <laughs> <laughs> this, we need to address mm -hmm. this like post haste. And it sounds like we're doing this already. Um, when we talk about the report card for the schools, math is a lagging area for us. Mm -hmm. That's a problem that we have an entire grade that needs additional, M may potentially need MCAS support that we didn't do it for. Mm -hmm. I, and that I, <coughs> I, I will, as a, as a parent and as a school committee member, um, that'll keep me up a little bit late tonight. And that's, I, I'm, I'm not okay with that. I, that's not something I can only speak for myself. I'm gonna ask as a future agenda item this to be something that we revisit to make sure that we're not taking a grade and punting on them, especially not in any area. Um, it, it's not a surprise. Our, our math scores are low when we took an entire grade that may need MCAS support and didn't do it for them this year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a massive gap. Did you say that I we're agree. doing it for ninth grade next, next, next year? Yes, we are, which is good. I just wanna make sure we're continuing year, it all the way through. Right. Um, the scheduling, um, Mrs. Banach went and did the scheduling a couple of weeks ago, and she indicated to me that there is a group of freshmen that have been recommended for ninth grade MCAS remediation, and that she has put in a slots into the schedule to accommodate those students. My other concern is, what are we doing for tenth grade next year? Because now, if we, we don't we carry, have tenth, so we the do. Students, it's yes, going to stay absolutely, and it's going to so, be. Yeah, and then so what about eleventh? It's going to grow actually. And then what about eleventh grade? These kids still, still need additional support. They've got to take it again in the 11th grade. Well, I think we do sort of one-on-one -on -one tutoring got with it. students that have been um, unsuccessful with the MCAS 10 and would need to retake in November Great. and again in March. Okay. And those are usually one-on-one -on -one basis. Yeah, that and hopefully it's there's very hopefully there's not a lot, and it's right. great that they're getting that we're able to provide that at one-on-one -on -one intention. So Scott, the high-level overview on that is we've done a kind of a two-year restructuring process mm -hmm. of the kind of math courses and um, mm -hmm. and programs, and that that's involved um, just the general math curriculum programs for students with special needs, mm -hmm. programs for um, English language learners, and. I think we're pretty much program-wise. We had an instructor in the math department this past year, and I think we've got the courses aligned after a two-year process. I think the target was, um, and again, we, we look at the um, students coming in the course requests every year, mm -hmm. and courses yeah. shift based on that. Right. Um, and one of the things about adding, like, like pushing the algebra up, it requires a need for more higher level courses. Right. Our, one of our bigger issues with math is not the students that are actually failing the test. That percentage is relatively low. Mm -hmm. It's the students that fall into that needs improvement area that we really want to push. So the number of kids, and Mary's absolutely correct with this, the number of kids who actually do not pass the MCAS right. is, is very low to the point where we wouldn't really necessarily hold the course it's, it, right. because the numbers just aren't there. It's the tutoring. What we're really focused on is getting a higher percentage of kids into the proficient area. And that's where the ninth and the tenth grade support is going to come in, right. and that's where I want to make sure we're. we're and, and, and this to is do this, that. this will this next year will be the second year of probably a two year restructuring and kind of math courses. Right. It's kind of the, the short answer. Okay. Thank you. 
I'm, and I'm probably going to go off course a little bit with this question, but um, so you, know, you guys have done a lot of work on restructuring the, 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 the curriculum, and, and it, you're both CTLs. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a number of different ways we can structure this, right? We keep the CTL structure, or you, we could have department heads that oversee the, the, the curriculum, right? Um, mm -hmm. it, any, any thoughts or ideas as to which structure is more effective? It, it, are we better off having department heads? Are we better off having CTLs? Like, what's the right... Maybe it's a question for you guys. I don't know. I guess for a CTL, that's a personal preference in terms of if you're going to take away some of mm -hmm. my classes from me, I love to be in the classroom. So that's a, it, it's got to be a give and take there, you know? So, if, if, well, uh, and I think you're making a good point. I think the difference... The difference between the two titles is the CTL is paid a stipend and, and the work is on their prep or right. after school, before right. school. Where a department head, a department head, you're, you're paying basically to ta teach one or two less courses, right. but be in the classroom and observing and coaching, which I think is very valuable. Um, but I think it takes a different kind of person too. It's not necessarily. Um, your best math teacher or, or whatever they want that you want somebody who was interested in being an administrator is interested in sitting and coaching and, and helping math teachers and if I could add one more piece to that um, in a lot of places where they do have department heads the department heads aren't part of the teachers union they're right. part of the, the administrators union because they tend to evaluate yeah. like, right. you know, teachers right. so it's a, it's, a, it's a bigger conversation but not one well, it shifts the really dynamic good. a little it bit it does yeah it does okay. so it's fun I'm Joey, I'm, I'm actually glad you brought that up. It was actually something so through the beginning of the week when we were doing the principal interviews, it was actually a recurring theme mm -hmm. that we heard from virtually all 12 candidates talking about department heads versus CTLs and sort of what are their merits on either side. And that was actually a conversation that we had had the other night, which is um, do we want to explore that? And that may be something that as we, we are heading into a collective bargaining year with the teachers union, because to Craig and Kevin's point, it, it, it may have a differentiation because they're actually doing assessment as well. It is a different role piece. But I, I agree with you. I think it is something that as a committee, we may want to ask our administration team to explore, especially as we prepare to go through a teacher's contract negotiation because it is something that would have to be collectively bargained um, as we get ready for that. So it's, I, it's a great question, Joe, and it was something that was on my mind coming out of Monday and Tuesday. Um, my brain's a little foggy at this point from those <laughs> meetings, so I would, but it was a great question. And there's obviously contractual contractual mm -hmm. implications. Mm -hmm. there's, there's financial implications mm -hmm. as well because I will have to potentially hire another teacher right. mm -hmm. to fill, right. you know, fill that space. But right. I think it also create alleviates some of the, the burden that's placed on the administration in terms of um, uh, observations yeah, and reviews, yeah. yes. and it allows yeah. you to really provide. Well, you have a content specialist that's going into the classroom Correct. too. Right across all the departments, which is important. Right. Again, if I teach, I teach five classes right now, I wouldn't want to go down to two right. classes of students. That's yeah. my preference. Perfect, you're hired. <laughs> 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 Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming in tonight. Yeah. Nice job. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, thank you guys. <coughs> thank you. Just, uh, Welcome, Jen. Craig, are you going to cover for Kathy oh. tonight as well? Yep, yes I am. So we have the report of the Assistant <laughs> Superintendent for Business and Human Resources. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, tonight I have eight warrant. We have eight warrants that need to be voted on. First warrant in the amount of twenty-three thousand two hundred thirty-nine dollars and twenty-one cents. Is there a motion? Motion from Joe, seconded from Jim. All in favor? Second in the amount of two hundred seventy-two thousand one hundred forty-three dollars and ninety-three cents. We have a motion. Motion from John, seconded by Scott. All in favor? Third in the amount of two thousand eight hundred thirty-five dollars. Motion from Jim, seconded by Jen. All in favor? Uh, fourth in the amount of thirty-two thousand six dollars and eighty-six cents. Motion from Jim, seconded by Joe. All in favor? Fifth in the amount of $170,644.33. Motion from Scott, seconded by John. All in favor? 
Sixth in the amount of $4,463.64. Motion from Jen, seconded by Jim. All in favor? Seventh in the amount of $400. Motion from John, seconded by Scott. All in favor? And the eighth and final, $240.02. Motion from Joe, seconded by Jen. All in favor? And there are no gifts tonight, I believe. Have a FY17 budget update, right? There's a handout for the committee. Yeah, should be a handout in the packet. Right. Uh, the the subcommittee update. There, there was no the, the climate culture morale meeting has to be scheduled this week, so no updates there. Um, I don't believe there are any other subcommittee updates this past since the last meeting. Um, we did skip over, I think before we go into future agenda items, we did skip over the, the policy readings. And um, now that Jen has joined us, <laughs> we could probably have that conversation about, about the policies. Um, so we, ha we have two policies that um, we wanted to bring forth for, for first readings, um, the religious holiday observance policy and then the Milford High School Woodland and Turf Fields complex usage. Um, you all have a copy of the policies in, in your packet. Um, Jen, I don't know if you want to take the lead on this, if you want uh, Kevin or I, and we just walked in. <laughs> yeah. It's page 94, if that helps. <laughs> 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 well, I think for the second read, are we just asking to see, oh no, this is the first read, right? Right. So the religious holiday, I know we just made some very minor updates to um, allow for some expression of um, religious observance at certain times of the year um, in a way that would be educational and instructional. Um, I think that we talked about setting aside a certain part of each school building that could be used for faculty and students um, to put some kind of a display out. I think that was about the only change that we made. And that's on page um, 95 in the packet too. Thank you, Just page 95. And, and if all of you recall, there, there was obviously a lot of confusion mm -hmm. around the policy um, last holiday season. And, and if, if I recall, it wasn't necessarily that the um, the language in the policy was flawed, that, but that people misinterpreted it. Um, and, and part of that is um, I think we, we can communicate the policy better to the, the staff. And we're certainly going to do that this year. And then to Jen's point, we did incorporate some language to allow for freedom of expression um, in certain common areas in, in the schools. And there was, there was some confusion too around personal expressions, which is already outlined in the policy. And I, I think we just need to clarify that with um, staff again, heading into the, the 2017-18 school year. Can, can I make one, one question? Or I have one question actually. I don't know if I overlooked this from last time, but with the, the freedom of expression, it kind of looks like it only pertains to students. Um, are we going to include teachers in this as well? We could definitely add that. And something we, we, we could look at. Yeah. I, think, cause I, I think that would be, I think from where they stemmed, it was a teacher it, or, or it, something that was absolutely, involved. Absolutely. And, and I don't see any of that referenced in here absolutely. at all. Absolutely. So I can definitely add that. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I actually. So a similar question uh, to Joey as well, which is, you know, the freedom of expression piece. Again, that, that it is only speaking to students and not to teachers. Um, the sense I was getting was not that this was much more from a teacher perspective. So that sort of goes back to um, how many teachers did we vet this revision of the policy with? I don't, I don't know the answer to that, that, that we brought it before we have, we, haven't, we haven't vetted it with any teachers. Okay. So that would be my first question. The other piece is as it relates to some of the language that's written in here um, and the alterations that were done to it, did we, because there's, there's a potentially some, some concerns that I have in here. So as an example, one of the statements that's in here, so this would be on page 95, this is under section five uh, for religious symbols. Um, towards the bottom, the second to last sentence I believe is, no religious symbols, including those related to holidays, should be represented in classrooms or on classroom materials unless these materials are directly related to, to curricular study about religion or culture. So if I'm a teacher that wants to wear a cross necklace. That would fall under personal expression. But pers freedom of expression doesn't include teachers. Well, we're going to add that. We just talked about that. Right. That was a good catch by Mr. Gallery. Right. 
but my concern is is this this all comes down to to your point Kevin this all comes down to how it was interpreted how it was communicated it is very easy with that language in there to continue to go down this still states no religious symbols so if I if a teacher wants to wear a star of David if a teacher wants to wear a um, a cross we're starting to flirt a little bit with potential First Amendment rights with freedom of expression to your point and freedom of speech so my question would be is is um, with the adjustments did we consult with town council to have them review this policy and the changes we have not at this point because it's a first reading and we're still making adjustments to it. correct but the so original the original policy, was vetted through we vetted through town council correct. and we vetted through the other attorney our, yeah, our, our, which is what this was built on so it was, it was yeah so that's correct so with any, with any type of a policy and certainly when we start to getting into from a laws perspective um, you know again I, I very simply I mean I I work in an industry if, if you've ever been to a mortgage closing boy you, you change one word in a pamphlet you've got to have your whole legal team go right back through everything and we change certainly a lot more than one word I, I would I would ask that we certainly go back through and do this as a larger piece is how are we defining holiday displays so is Halloween a holiday is flag day a holiday is Memorial Day a holiday um, how are we defining those because it says holiday displays and then and then what are we including as holiday decorations are we including secular or just religious so as an example the Supreme Court has ruled that Santa Claus is a secular um, is a secular item as opposed to a religious item so I, there's still my concern that I have with this is um, this seems to be a solution in search of a problem where I understand that there has been at least to my knowledge a complaint that has come through um, this is still and I get that and we want to be respectful I, what I'm seeing is is this seems to be this seems to have a lot of exclusionary language that goes along with it and and my understanding within the schools is in our objective in creating policy is to create as much inclusiveness as possible this is really not doing that in my opinion I, I'm looking at this we're going where it's you, you, you can't do this or it can only do that it's very restrictive we're we're removing some of that and at the end of the day this is still the town of Milford this is a town where we have a Santa Claus parade that is over 20,000 people that come to it every year we have one we have a menorah lighting in the downtown we have one of the oldest um, temples in Massachusetts we have two of the largest Catholic churches in the Worcester Diocese Mass Milford has been an inclusive community when it comes to religious freedoms for many many years when when individuals that were members of the synagogue weren't allowed to when they were still restricted communities People couldn't move into other towns. They moved to Milford because we have one of the oldest synagogues in the state. I, I don't think we suffer from an issue of inclusiveness when it comes to religious freedom. If we have an ongoing, very persistent, large community issue where we have policies and we have procedures and we have things that are going on in schools that are causing concerns for, for, for students, and again, I don't want to eliminate if we've got one concern. If we've got one concern, we want to make sure we're, we're addressing that, or two concerns but what's the impact here? This is a broad-based policy that impacts 4,400 students, every member of our faculty. And to deny religion is to deny the history of the world. Every, civilized, every civilization in the world grew up around some sort of religion. If we're talking about the whole idea behind in the first, talks about the first part of the first page on page 94, it talks about the separation of church and state. The intent behind separation of church and state was to make it so that the head of the church couldn't also be the head of the state, and also so that the, sta the state was not forcing religious beliefs upon one way or the other. I'm not saying that we should be doing the Our Father in the morning. What I'm saying is, is we're we're taking we're taking you know we're taking Santa this to the phone call I got last year and I talked about it in February. Why almost, how come Santa Claus is being thrown out of Milford schools? 
I had a six-year-old call me and have that conversation. Mm -hmm. This doesn't fix that. This still doesn't address that. I'm very disappointed to see that we didn't talk to teachers. Teachers were the ones that were, that were having to deal with this and they were making phone calls and we didn't talk to any of them. That's a concern. So I, I understand that we've had some concerns that have come forward in the past. I'd, I'd love to, as a committee, be able to come together and understand what that full impact is. What's the larger impact of this? Are we needing to get to this point? I, when it first came through last summer, I had a lot of concerns about it and some questions. It ultimately went through and passed, and, and I, will be the, I will be the first one to admit, I did in fact vote for it at the time because I asked about the spirit of it when we had that conversation. When the execution came down and it, and it actually came out to fruition, it wasn't executed, it was taken out of context. A lot of the pieces that are in here, as we talked about earlier just in some of our presentations, just something as simple as in the absence of having the full color that goes around this, we're, we're left to take things at face value. <clears throat> I'm not comfortable that we're at a point right now where it's necessary for us to, be for us to say that holiday displays are permitted in public areas and they may not be visible outside the school facility. I, I, that's going to work in other communities. That, you know what? And that's, if that's, Cam that's Cambridge. That works. And that's fine because that's what the overwhelming majority of that community supports. I certainly have not heard, nor have I seen anything that tells me that Milford's, that that Milford's at that point. We talked about, you know, again, religious music may not be part of, you know, section seven, music. Religious music may be part of, may be part of but not dominate such concerts. How do we determine religious music? So we talk about um, in a Memorial Day program. My country tis of thee, says God. It does. Santa Claus is coming to town, does not reference any religion. It doesn't reference the birth of Christ. It doesn't say the word Christmas. It doesn't mention anything of that nature. By the way, dreidel, dreidel, dreidel doesn't mention anything with regards to Hanukkah. It's not a religious song. How are we determining those? There's so much gray area in this. Are we really at that point? Well, just to, to give a little clarity, um, I think that the reason why we reconvened the policy um, was at the request of, of this committee, at the request of the greater population and concerns that came forward. Mm -hmm. So the measures that we took as a subcommittee were to try to address some of the challenges that were brought forward and I will tell you that I, I think, now I don't want to speak for the committee, but I think the philosophy was to try to make it as broad as we could and to make it as inclusive as we could while also um, trying to stay in line with the other school committees in the state of Massachusetts because most of the language in this policy is MASC language that's been adopted by many other communities in Milford. So what I can tell you um, as someone who is a religious minority in the town of Milford, um, I can think back to before I even had children watching on cable TV the December concert and being overwhelmed by the disproportionate amount of religious music and holiday music in my estimation, um, I didn't think that was appropriate for a school concert. And I remember reaching out to Jose um, Vieira at the time because he was the assistant superintendent. Um, and fast forward multiple years, I, I will tell you that as one member of the school community, I do see, feel concerned when I can look at the outside of a building and look into an administration office window and see a display of Christmas lights. I don't think that's a, a appropriate given the vast number of religions that we have in our schools. Um, I think another reason and something that I tried to, to focus in on last December or whenever it was when we talked about this is the amount of distractions that go on in a school. And when you work in a school, day in and day out at this time of year, it's a very challenging time of year for a number of students. And you're right, they're inundated. It's in the town hall, it's in the stores, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you can make a choice as a family not to go to those places, but you can't make a choice as a child not to walk into a school. And unfortunately, we had a couple of situations where um, symbols that you're right, not, not religious symbols, secular symbols and elf on the shelf and other such items were being used in really inappropriate ways in the classrooms. And what I find in my position is that when you don't have any boundaries, 
people take liberties to do what they want, and sometimes um, it goes too far. So I think our purpose in this was to try to put some parameters on it, and unfortunately, I think what happened, and I mean, this, it, this can happen in any, any place where you have something new, I think the interpretation um, got a little out of hand, and I think people did get to the point where it, things were misinterpreted. And as I think we've said around this table multiple times, it wasn't that somebody can't wear a necklace or a sweater or, or any of that stuff. Um, so I think that what was probably the most lacking in this was the understanding on the part of staff, the understanding um, maybe on the part of administration of what this was going to look like and play out. Um, one of the things we added in here was to try to be more inclusive, exactly to your point, originally this policy said there would be no religious displays in public areas, and that's what the MASC model um, policy states, and um, this actually was a compromise on my part because I wasn't really thrilled with that, but when we talked about putting a display in a public place, we talked about having some explanation, not just dropping a, a tree and a dreidel and whatever else, it, but we talked about having some kind of purpose for that that would be educational and instructional. Um, so, you know, clearly we did not vet this with teachers and I'd be happy to go back, but honestly, I, I'm almost tempted to say if we go back, I'd almost like to see it go back to what we had originally, where even like you said, the original language was should be represented on teacher-generated papers and materials. So I think there are some things that we could uh, be more clear on. Um, you're right, we don't want to have a lot of um, ambigu ambiguity in it, but I, we, I also don't want to get to the point where we have a, a policy that says you can have a, 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 a snowman, you can't have a Santa. I mean, I think the more we try to add detail to this, the more challenging and exclusive it's going to be. Um, and I think the other piece of this is trying to celebrate, you're right, that there are so many religions and beliefs in Milford, and, and we do want to be able to celebrate all of them without po imposing one or two of the most prominent Christmas, December, you know, type holidays in the schools. So my, my concern on there, so there's a couple of things, and, and I, I appreciate what you're saying, Jen. So a couple of things. Um, we talk about religious symbols, and then we mm -hmm. talk about holiday displays. Mm -hmm. They're not the same. You just mentioned a couple. So the big piece, and the, what, what drove a lot of this, from my understanding, was a concern around, as you mentioned, an elf on the shelf that mm -hmm. was being used, which again is a secular piece. Mm -hmm. That's not a religious art item, mm -hmm. and we've, this has become a religious holiday observance mm -hmm. and religious expression policy. That's not a religious expression. That's a holiday expression. So is it a holiday policy? And in which case, which holidays are we specifying? Because for Flag Day, the holiday decoration is the American flag. Are we saying that we can't have the American flag displayed? Because the way this reads right now says that holiday displays and a holiday display for Flag Day is the American flag. Except with the expression, exception that the policy is titled Religious Holiday Observance and Religious Holiday Expression. So I guess it would be my understanding that by the title of the policy, that's and that what you're talking about. So here's the challenge. I, mm -hmm. And I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Here's the challenge with the ambiguity. It's related to religious holidays. Yeah. And it says religious holiday observance and religious policies. Mm -hmm. It is op left, left open to pretty broad interpretation of, okay, what holidays? And rather than be exclusive and say, in my, in my opinion, rather than say, to your point, I would not feel comfortable driving by any school and only seeing Christmas lights out. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I would much rather see Christmas lights and a menorah and us recognizing all religious celebrations that are going on at that time and have those be prominently displayed throughout the schools, visible to the public as they drive by, but encompassing all of them rather than saying none of them. And that's where, that's where this is coming into play. What we're saying is, is because rather than include everybody, we're gonna include no one. And that's where my concern comes in. Yes, we've got it in public places, but why would we say, I would, I, would rather, I would love to have a menorah out there. We, we have one in town. Our, our synagogue just celebrated 150 years, mm -hmm. I, I believe. Um, Rabbi Mindy speaks at almost every public event, as does one of, our, one of the priests from almost every church that comes in. I, I'm not sure why at the schools 
why it's okay for Town Park, which is publicly funded and is town-owned property, it's okay to display a menorah and why at the schools we're trying to eliminate that. Why would it be okay to have a, a Christmas tree in town square, but not okay in the schools for us to display it? Again, prominently, and again, we can do it in public places, but why not have that freedom of expression? Why is it being so limiting on that? that that's the piece that I, I'd rather see us be far more expansive on that piece. And again, it's open for interpretation. It says holidays, okay. Well, Halloween is a religious holiday for some. Um, in addition to for, for some children, and we have these in the Milford community, for some children, the only Thanksgiving celebration they get is the one they get in school. The only Christmas celebration or, or Hanukkah celebration or um, any other religious celebration that they may receive is the one that they have at school. To your point, I, I remember being at Woodland School and Jan Carlin coming in and teaching us how to make potato latkes on, during Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. That had nothing to do with a lesson plan. It was done during recess. But there's that's nothing an in this that prohibits piece. that. That's not prohibited by this policy. It says that you can only do it as it relates to curriculum. That wasn't curriculum related. It was done during snack time. But a teacher can, there's, there are many different ways you can work a tradition into your curriculum. They, so if you start talking about customs, traditions, mm -hmm. um, that's an educational piece. To me, a live educational activity is different from um, a school that's decorated like a holiday scene. And, and to the point about Halloween, that's something else that, we, that did come up in our meeting. And we are actually talking about some alternatives because that is becoming more of a tradition that feels exclusive if we're talking simply about Halloween and costumes because of the number of kids mm -hmm. that aren't participating. So is that, are we now classifying, and that's, so again, I, I, I still believe that, in my opinion, I, I don't believe we're at a place where this is a policy that necessarily belongs in the town, is needed in the town of Milford at this point. So That being said, I understand that, you know, it, this is, it, it just, there, there's not, and this may be oversimplifying it, it, it just doesn't seem to pass the common sense test for me. There's so many other it. things. So this is a this is our policy. Okay. And, and I'm making and a I, motion that it be, that it be okay. abandoned right now. Okay. Well, can, can I ask a question before you about the policy before you make any motion? Sure. No, that's not a real formal procedure. But what and and I agree with many points from both of these conversations. But from a simple perspective, you said it's you know it, this is a religious pol uh, policy, and we we've had the conversation that Christmas is a, is not a, is basically secular in nature. So. Um, can we put a Christmas tree out front based on this proposed policy? Um, and, and again, no, holiday lights. we can't. But, but Christmas is, would you said it's not a religious? No, Christmas is a religious holiday. Uh, right, but Christmas tree. I'm sorry, Christmas tree. Christmas tree by the Supreme Court was not considered a religious symbol. That's what I meant. That's I'm sorry, Christmas, Christmas tree. Yeah, Christmas Obviously, is Christmas holiday, is a religious yeah, holiday. Is. But so by this Very policy right now, yeah. would, would, mm -hmm. that, would that Christmas tree be allowed out front? Because it, it's not a religious symbol. It's a holiday symbol, and it's a secular holiday symbol in my estimation it would not be I mean that's that's my interpretation of the policy. but you just said it's it'd be a religious policy it'd be, we just it'd be allowed in the common area because this policy states that you can have a common area with it for some religious kind of instructional bench to it and I, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with your right, point no, I'm, I'm not, trying to right. maybe point out a flaw in right well if we agree on this policy and not maybe there's a flaw in the policy in itself that that's a secular object uh, or a secular holiday, secular object for a religious holiday. I don't know what I'm trying to say but right now. But it's a secular <laughs> object that's representative of a religious holiday. But here's the problem, Jen. The Supreme Court disagrees with you. Well, but we, we can make any policy we want. It doesn't have to, it still it doesn't have to go along with the it, Supreme it, Court. It, it, no, it, it, see, actually, Jen, that's but, where you're wrong. We're but, elected but officials and we're a government no, policy. Actually, we still have to follow the United States Supreme Court. Yeah, that's hold, a rule. Hold, hold on. Yeah, finish your <laughs> But well, I, I, I have to go back to our job is to support instruction and curriculum for students in our schools. And our job is to ensure a safe, equitable place for children to learn. And I would say that with the amount of things that were going on in these schools, we were depriving a number of children of a safe, equitable learning environment because there were no boundaries or parameters put around it. 
and that's why this came to fruition. This is why it was brought up to parents, to, to us to bring forward to policy, and that's where we came to this. So, I mean, th this is the policy we have, and I think in fairness to the request, we, we took it back, and we tried, and, and I'm, I'm not gonna say, maybe we could take it back and make it better, um, but, in, and we can vote however we want, but I, I, I couldn't possibly support going back to a place where we have Christmas and Hanukkah and a lot of religious symbols all over our schools. I don't, as a school principal who sees what happens at that time during the year is not appropriate and it's not conducive to a serious academic setting, which is what I think we should be focusing on. It, the, the initial intent of the, the policy is, is to, to protect people's freedom to, of expression. And that language is, is very clear in the policy now Obviously, there's an oversight not including teachers, and that's something we're certainly going to go back and, and address. But mm -hmm. it, the policy is very clear that students and, 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 and we'll say teachers have a right to express their um, freedom of, of religion. It's also very clear that um, teachers can incorporate religious symbols into their teaching as long as it's part of the lesson, as long mm -hmm. as they're teaching about certain traditions, like bringing in and cooking the lackeys or whatever it might be. Like, that's allowed, that's okay. It's, it, it, the, the, this policy would allow that because mm -hmm. there's an educational component to that. Um, you know, to Jen's point, um, the, the intent is to provide those guidelines because th there are students and there are families that are feeling excluded. And they, they're feeling like their beliefs um, aren't as valued at, as others. And, and that's what we're trying to, to address with this with this policy to provide that, that level of, of equity because I, I know it's been said, you know, those, those families and those children don't have to go to the town park. They don't have to go to um, these churches or to these uh, synagogues, but they do have to go to the classroom and they do have to be in the, in the classroom. And, and, that, and, and that's why this policy was originally drafted. Um, now, we obviously should have vetted this by the, the, the teachers um, to get their feedback because they, they, are, they raised a lot of concerns last year we need to add that language about the teachers' freedom of expression. So maybe we just take this back, add that language, vet it with the teachers, get some feedback from the teachers, and then we bring it back for another reading. Would you guys be amenable to that? Um, yeah, well, I just wanted to kind of reiterate what Jen said earlier. I think one of the biggest problems with this policy last year was the misinterpretation of it. Um, we discussed that at the time, but by the time we could ask them to bring something forward so we could interpret our own policy, you know, that holiday season will be over. So. I just don't want that lost on this. this. This the problem isn't just with the policy. If there if that is a problem, the, but there is a problem with the interpretation that uh, certain people made, and and it you know it sort of spread, and it may not have been an accurate interpretation. And I think you know to that point, I think the the pieces that it's a it's definitely a difference of opinion. Um, I'm of the opinion that we should not exclude anybody. So the answer to that is not excluding everybody. The answer to that is to include everybody. And we have representation of all of the celebrations that are going on. Not that we don't recognize celebration, because here's the, here's the potential slippery slope. Mm -hmm. It allows for, in public areas, mm -hmm. displays of holidays. I don't know how that fixes disproportionate levels of so in a public area, we put up a Christmas tree, and we put up Santa Claus, and we put up Christmas lights, and we put up a menorah. We still haven't fixed the problem that there's four decorations and three of them are related to one holiday, because we haven't fixed that problem in this. Rather, why wouldn't we look to include all and allow that opportunity throughout all of the classrooms and throughout all the schools? To your point, Joe, you're right. They don't have to go to Town Park, so great. If we're going to go down this road of creating a policy to make it more inclusive, great, have it be inclusive of all religions and all holiday celebrations. In addition to, I think we need to, as we go through with this, be very descriptive and be very clear because here's where the challenge comes in. It says holiday displays as it relates, and then it says in a category that says religious symbols. Okay, well then we're gonna have to really get clear if we're gonna go down that road of defining what that is because to John's point, I think he said it very well, a, a Christmas tree sitting out front, it may be an interpretation of some that that's a religious item. However, the United States Supreme Court, that's still the rule of the land that we have to follow, as we all do, has said it's not. 
it said it's not a it's not a religious symbol. It's a considered a non secular one. And by the way, it's actual its basis has nothing to do with Christmas. It's actually a pagan holiday. A pagan holiday rec dec decoration. As by the way is Santa Claus. So the historical the historic the history the history lesson here is, is it has nothing to do with Christmas. Now, where I would agree with you is is if we wanted to put a manger scene out in front of out in front of the school, that's a religious piece. I got it. That I would agree with you. I would drive by, and as somebody who does celebrate Christmas, I would really feel uncomfortable with that. I, I, That's the challenge. If I could jump in, um, I, I, I think it, it goes, I, I think, three points. The first one is I think it'd be, I think, an unwieldy and burdensome requirement if every teacher in every classroom had to put like a Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, and you could pick. I mean, you know, 10 to 12 other religious traditions kind of represented in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the reason why the compromise was the public space. The second point is I think a lot of the, um, there's, there's very little issue at the secondary level. I think the concern at the secondary level was around personal expression because we just don't see um, a ton of, um, there's not as much kind of, it's like this is an issue, with, like once you get, I think, Stacy and beyond. You just don't see a lot of it. Um, Three, I think we have a number of issues connected to this, and it's not just around the, the symbol. And this is, I think, a lot of people have focused on. You know, we've had issues with like homework policies around holidays that students are celebrating. Mm -hmm. That we've had, you know, uh, complaints over the years. I, not a lot of them, but they'll, they'll come up. Um, issues around um, the use of, you know, traditions that maybe not everybody follows, that goes against um, the traditions of certain families. And you know that, that can be very problematic for a parent to explain to a child around. You know, I think the Elf on the Shelf is a great example of that. But there's others. Um, the, the Halloween piece with a horrible parade, which we're looking at rebranding and having a similar event but a more inclusive event. Um, and that's the direction where I think we're trying to go with a lot of these pieces. Is I think you know your point is well stated about you don't want to, you know, be exclusive in the spirit of being inclusive. But there are, I think, a variety of challenges on a variety of levels that we see, you know, across our schools. Um, I think the religious expression one is a simple one, and I think that can be explained very easy because I think both teachers and students, with, with one correction, we can make that, and that's easy. I think the the, the, the holiday piece, I think, is going to be complicated, and we're going to have, I think, questions about what's a symbol, what isn't a symbol. But I think to say, you know, classroom teachers would have to represent all traditions or a lot of traditions. I think would be challenging for a lot of teachers and not something they would want to spend. And I could be wrong, but I think a lot of teachers wouldn't want to spend a, a ton of time trying to represent every single holiday tradition in every single classroom. And I think that's where the public space piece, I think is a reasonable compromise because I think one of the things we talked about at the subcommittee level is that, you know, we'd have schools develop committees to kind of put together a display maybe in December that represented the traditions of, and again, I don't think we're ever going to catch everybody but the vast majority of, you know, the students or, or family traditions in the school and try to connect kind of an educational purpose to it because it does get, um, you know, I could talk to Tim, Lisa, or Lisa, and it does get very difficult to maintain focus, you know, that week before the December vacation. The, the challenge, Kevin, and I, and I hear what you're saying, the challenge is, is when we've got a policy that to explain it takes more than two sentences, you don't get a lot of people past the second sentence. When it's that complex, to your point, I agree, and that's why. I, I, and so that first page, and I want to be very clear, the first page of this it talks about guidelines with ex excused absences, notification, homework assignments, sports and extracurricular activities. I think is extremely important. I, I think that should be very valid. I, I think that's extremely valid. It's on this second piece. It's it's such a slippery slope, because, to your point, we can't define it. So here's the challenge we run into. At what point, where does this all fall in? And what, how do we define? So tomorrow a parent calls up and says, by the way, the mention of God, or the word God, appearing in Milford Public Schools outside of curriculum, I have a problem with because I'm an atheist. Okay. So here's the challenge we face. We allow US currency in our public schools. It says, in God we trust. Well, if I'm an atheist, that flies directly in the face of my religious beliefs. This is, the, this is that first step down that path. Are we at a point where we want to start to outlaw U.S. currency in our, in our schools? 
that I mean it's and I and I realize that I'm taking this to an extreme level this is the path we are starting down I want to be very clear it's that that's that's a that's an expression of a, of a of a religious deity far more so than Santa Claus so I one thing I will say in um, having implemented a policy like this in two other school districts is that one benefit of it agreeing that it this is not a black and white topic you're right anytime you talk about religion it's going to take more than two minutes because to your point, it's vast, it's, it's personal, um, it, it's huge. But what it has done is it's opened people's eyes to a conversation. And so what I've always guided people at this time of year is to say, if you have a question about something, talk to a colleague. If you want to decide in your mind if this is appropriate for a classroom, talk to a colleague, talk to me. If you have something, if you have a parent who wants to come in and read, "'Twas the night before Christmas or Santa Claus is coming to town, Let's find a way to make that work and let's frame it under, this is a family tradition. This is just like the Lockies, that's someone else's family tradition. And if you're looking at a math paper and you have a whole bunch of addition problems that are sitting inside of Santa Claus bodies, even if it's a secular object or um, symbol, I don't see where that has a place in a math lesson. But it might have a, a place where you're talking about a family tradition and something that many American families celebrate and families across the world at a certain time of year. So it may bring up more conversations, but in my experience, it's been valuable because people have been able to come together and talk about what is the value of this, and this is the, the thing that I've been the most adamant about the whole time with this. What is the purpose? What is the expected outcome? What do we expect students to walk away with and be able to know and understand? And is it understanding we have a diverse population in a school? Is it understanding that there are 15 different holidays, not the two or three that we've historically focused on? Um, it, 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 and it's to talk about the inclusiveness. So even though some things may get the boot because they're really wildly inappropriate, like a manger scene, there are other things that can be worked in and with a purpose, um, rather than just walking into a free-for-all. So Except for the fact that the way, what we've got, all the stuff that you're concerned about actually doesn't get addressed. Because Christmas does. like, Christmas lights are non-secular. It's not. It's not a. It's not a religious symbol. Neither Santa Claus. Neither is a Christmas tree. So if I am a school teacher and I read this and I say, okay, so a religious symbol has no place as re, as it relates to a religious symbol of, hol of holiday display. Christmas trees, as de as defined by the United States Supreme Court, is a non is a secular decoration. So it is no different than putting a candy cane on a on a on a on a putting a candy cane. On some kid, on a student's paper when they did well on a paper, is not has nothing to do with religion. So uh, can I make a recommendation? Just because I think we're at the first reading phase of mm -hmm. this, and I don't think we're moving anywhere in right. terms of the discussion. Some of the arguments are great on, on, on both sides of the issues or multiple sides of the issues. I would say that um, you know maybe we re readdress this at the subcommittee level and, and come back again. I think you know obviously including the, the teacher aspect because I think that just makes sense mm -hmm. and agree. talking about some of the issues that were raised would be my recommendation just at this point today Inclu yeah. and also including town council on that anytime you make a change to something like this. A absolutely and I think we do we that we need to make sure we, in we include teacher feedback um, as well as as well as you know potentially parent feedback additional parent feedback and then certainly also making sure the town council weighs in on it if we're changing a policy especially to your point Jen that's as potentially sensitive as religion and, fr and freedom of expression. Yeah, I, I definitely want my attorney sitting next to me. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd, right. I'd agree with that. Um, in, and as I've been listening and rereading this, um, I think we need to decide what we do want to allow or enable because as I'm reading this, I understand your, your intentions, Jen, and, mm -hmm. and your intentions with this policy, but as I read it, that middle section, I agree with uh, one of the uh, last things Scott said. It, it doesn't prohibit uh, a Santa Claus from being out front or in the hallway or or anything else and if that's what we want to do that's what we need to write because this writing doesn't do it but um, uh, I don't know why I'm saying this but we've already beat it to death a little bit I think I'd agree with Kevin <laughs> <laughs> let's move on so so Scott we're moving does on. have a motion <laughs> out there though right did you make a official I motion? did I made a motion to abolish the policy all right was there is there a second I'll second it 
forward. I mean, I think I think it's, it needs a lot more work. I don't know if that makes it go but to no, a second he, reading. I'm not sure how that works. No, it eliminates getting the policy, the policy entirely. It doesn't as it stands, because that, so here's the challenge. It's under review, but this is the policy of this is the law of the land as it stands right this particular okay. moment, which is the reason for my for my motion as it stands. I my motion is is that we throw out and eliminate this policy with the ultimate hopes that we go back and draft something again. I talked about the first page I think is important that we do have in our policies. But as we stand here today, this is the policy, which is why my, my motion is to eliminate this policy, again, with the hopes that the policy subcommittee will come back with something that's completely altered. But in the meantime, this is what's in place, which is why I would say my motion is to eliminate that. To be clear, your policy, not, not with the red lines, do you? The policy as it stands today, which is not what's in front of us. With Correct, the red lines. which is not which is in, which is not what's in front of us with the red lines, so that we can go back and hopefully, with, with the intent behind this, is that we can go back, rethink this, go back and get all the all the things that we just agreed upon and talking about, which is get teacher feedback, get administrator feedback, include town council in in reviewing this policy again, um, as we go forward with this. Otherwise, this policy as it stands without the red line is in place as we sit here today. All right, so there's a motion if we send the policy. Is there a second? I'll second it. A second from mm -hmm. Joe. Is there a discussion? Yeah. Had it. <laughs> well, not, at, not since the motion's been made and seconded. <laughs> okay. There hasn't been a discussion. My fear is that if we abolish this policy now, we never revisit it and we never end up with a policy. Uh, I think you should amend the policy, and I think you should invite um, Mr. Harrison to the next meeting. I'm on, on the the I'm on the budget committee. committee. Oh, well, there you go. I mean, I'm on the policy. So he's already invited. Right. Well, then, I, so <laughs> I think you should take it back to policy and have this discussion. It is. There's a meeting in June. I don't think you should yeah. abolish the policy because then you have to start from scratch again. Well, you can actually take the frameworks just like you can take it from any school district that exists. Yeah, but there's no reason you can't amend it. Except for the fact that this is what's in place right now, and I, my, my, that's why I made the motion. My motion is, it, and again, my motion very clearly is to abolish this policy as it stands with the intent of going back and completely restructuring from ground, in completely restructuring this policy. But as it stands right now, this is the law of the land, which is why the reason for it. So that's, my, my full motion is, is that we rescind the current policy with the intent to go back and restructure and rebuild. And the, the alternative to that is the policy stays in place and we just go through the normal process of a second reading and making revision, or making revisions and bring it back for a second reading. So the, the only difference is either we abolish it for however, however long, or we just go through the normal process that we would go through with any policy where. And it's so either way, you're going to rewrite it. Right. It, Correct. The the challenge, the chal the difference though to that point, Joe. The difference is though, if this was a first reading on an introduction of a full pol of a new policy, that's different than what this is. This is the first reading of a revised existing policy. So yes, either way, it's going to go back. But it's the same thing as saying, we have a policy in place that says you can't have water bottles in school. And we say we want to go back and say, well, we really don't, it's not that we don't want water bottles, it's that we don't want the kids flipping them. Well, if we say, okay, well, let's go policy, go back and change the policy, great. In, until we get that work done, no, no water bottles are allowed in school. See the difference? Right, That's so we have a motion and we have we have a second. A second. Can, I, can I put just two more quick things on the table, just so everybody's like, <laughs> I really want I to move on. I know you do. <laughs> Go ahead. I know you do, but I just want to make sure everybody's clear. Yeah. The policy was um, it's a, it, two things. One, it was based on MASC model language, which is what we base a lot of our policies on. And the second piece is that the original policy was vetted through our, our attorneys. So I just, want to make, I just want to make sure that all, that all the committee members are aware of both Well, and if I could just add, I think the issue with the policy as it stands was the perhaps the presentation and certainly the interpretation of the policy and so given the fact that we spent a lot of time working and using the model language and that we've been open as a policy subcommittee and as a full committee to going back and revisiting and that our administration is open to going back and revisiting um, and clarifying for next year and considering the fact that we don't have any religious holidays that I'm aware of between now and next December I, I I couldn't support abolishing it, but I can support going back and revisiting it and trying to make it feel more comfortable for everybody and going through all the vetting processes that you talked about. All right, so we have a motion from Scott, a second from Joe. Is, is everyone in favor of abolishing the policy? Right, so two to four. Two to four. 
So we'll continue with the, the normal process. Mm -hmm. um, two to three. Two to three. What do you want to you want to ask? All opposed. There's a point of. Oh, all right. Good. Right. So. All opposed. All right. So four opposed and two, two. in favor. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll follow the the process. We'll come back to uh, the subcommittee, um, and the subcommittee will will have some discussion around it, and, and obviously bring the teachers into the loop and um, bring counsel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next policy shouldn't be as controversial. <laughs> <laughs> I was we at a lovely concert at Stacy <laughs> Middle School, and I came back and said, oh, look, they've already dealt with that. Yay. <laughs> Thomas Hamilton. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is the first read of the Milford High School and Woodland There's Elementary special. School okay. turf field. A couple of things that I think were notable changes is we made an adjustment to the dates um, by which people needed to apply for use of the fields, and that was to help out with scheduling, make that easier for everyone and um, more effective. Obviously, the woodland field is added into this policy on top of the high school field. We made a slight shift to the fee for the outside groups for the use of the Milford High School field uh, turf stadium. And that went, I believe, from $100 an hour to $125 an hour. Can, can, I, can I ask one, one quick question? Yes. Um, why would the elementary school not be 125 either? Is that because like no stands, no concessions, yeah. any, so, any of that yeah, stuff? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what I thought. Thank you. Yeah. Was there anything else, Joe, that no, you that was that was it. It was really incorporate, incorporating changes. woodland was the big thing, mm -hmm. right? Because we didn't have yeah. we didn't have language for woodland in place before, mm -hmm. uh, and then the slight fee adjustment, and that's again just to reiterate or underscore it, that only applies to mm -hmm. all other groups beyond um, the Milford Youth Organizations and the, right. the adult organizations. Mm -hmm. Just just a quick question on that: Do we know of any other? Because this we ran into this when we did. I was on the committee. I was on the policy subcommittee when we devised the first one, and it was. It was, believe it or not, a longer conversation than what we just had on the last <laughs> policy. Um, and there were about 95 parents at a meeting okay. as a result. <laughs> so um, with regards to that, are we aware of any other youth organizations that are Milford-based? Uh, that we haven't listed here? Yeah. Uh, no, not okay. that would use the field. Uh, there's obviously other Milford, Milford organizations, but they wouldn't necessarily right, use exactly. the field. Right, exactly. That's why I, would, I, I just want to yeah. make sure, if we go through and do this stuff, I just want to make sure because it's... Right. Yeah. I, it was standing room only the last time we introduced Do you remember this. what was left out that time? What organization? Uh, it was cost Cross. related. Oh, oh, okay, okay. It wasn't real in regards to that, but just it was a... Okay. It was it, a chutchy policy as relates to costs, but it was a lot of other things that were in there too, so I just want to make okay. sure. Okay. And, and along yeah. those lines, we did look at some be fee benchmarking data from mm -hmm. neighboring communities, and, mm -hmm. and we're, we're very, very competitive in that regard. There's, there's probably a little bit of flexibility here, um, but obviously we want to keep the cost low, especially for, for our, youth. our youth organization. So mm -hmm. um, you know, increasing the fee, $25 per hour for outside groups to use the high school, that $125 an hour is still very, very competitive. Well, yeah, no, let me be clear. It had nothing to do with outside groups. I, it was to be very, very specific, and I'm not being coy for the benefit of the public watching at home. It was a very, very heated discussion over because this was used with taxpayer money. It wasn't coming from the school budget. Mm -hmm. It was it was initially billed through town meeting as being a community, a community field. Right. Um, the initial cost when we, when it was looked at and reviewed for what the costs were going to be associated with it. And this was actually right before I actually got on the committee. Yeah. Um, the policy was created afterwards. They were looking at a cost because they did look at area towns. It was the internal cost of twenty five dollars an hour that was the issue. Um, it was billed out as being twenty five dollars an hour, which is very low, mm -hmm. actually right. for t for town fields. The outside costs and and the and the public and again the public at that point was very clear. Yeah, we don't care what you charge outside towns. You can charge them three hundred dollars an hour. We don't care as long as field gets used. That's good, but we've just not Milford residents. If you're a taxpayer in Milford, it should be a low cost, mm -hmm. and that's where it is. So no, I'm yeah. good. Like I said, the okay. piece for that was really just I just want to make sure we weren't missing any groups. Right. All right. Um, so do we have a motion to approve? The turf field policy motion from Joe, seconded by Scott. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Um, 
All right, so we're going to go back to future agenda items. Does anyone have any future agenda items? Just the one I brought up earlier with regards to reviewing that. Yeah. Any other future agenda items in the committee? Any old business? Any old business? And do I have a? We do have an executive session tonight. Um, there was a to discuss an MTA grievance. Uh, we will not be returning from executive session. It does require roll call to go into executive session. Sir, yeah. Jim. Yes. Yep. Yes. 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 All right, so we'll be going into executive session, and do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion from Scott, seconded by John. <laughs> All in favor? All right, thank you.